Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee in 2023. I've not received any apologies for today's meeting. Um, before I begin, I want to take the opportunity to thank everyone who came along to our informal engagement session in Dunfermline yesterday. Um, sessions were extremely informative, um, not to say fun, the latter ones were, were particularly fun. And they're going to be very uh, useful in forming an inquiry into female participation in sport and physical activity. So we, we had a round table, an informal round table with the Scottish Sports Association, with uh, many, many bodies, sports bodies from around Scotland, which was extremely informative. And then we went on to the Carnegie Judo Club and heard about the Fighting Chance project um, in Dunfermline and then finished off in the Rain Basketball Club for hosting us. And we were put through our paces in both, some of us more than others, um, which you will see when the photographs emerge from, from both of those sessions. But it was, it was a fantastic opportunity to speak to uh, women involved in sport. Um, uh, in, in, in a couple of different um, sort of demographics. Um, so thank you so much for hosting us. Um, the first item on the agenda is to decide whether to take items five and six in private. Are we all agreed to do that? We're agreed. And the second item on our agenda is uh, our final evidence session in the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill. And today we'll be taking evidence from the Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport. And I welcome to the meeting Marie Todd, the Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport. And she is joined by her officials, Annalena Winslow, the Safety, Openness and Learning Unit Head, and Will Wood, the Patient Safety Commissioner Bill Team Leader, both from the Scottish Government. So welcome to you all. Um, Minister, I believe that you've got an opening statement to make. Uh, thank you, Convener. Yes, just briefly, and thank you, Committee, for inviting me to give evidence. Um, I want to open by playing, paying tribute to the work of Baroness Cumberledge and her team and the patients and healthcare staff and professionals who've worked so hard to contribute to the development of this bill. I'm certain that future generations um, will benefit from safer care because of their efforts. I think it would be helpful to make some brief opening remarks summarising the intention behind the bill. Um, patients, their families and the wider public have told us that too often they don't feel listened to when they raise concerns about the safety of their care. The Patient, Commissioner Safe, um, the patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland will be an independent public advocate whose primary focus will be on ensuring that the patient voice is heard in the healthcare system to make care safer for all. Patients told us that the Commissioner must be independent of both the government and the NHS, which is why we are proposing that the role is answerable to Parliament directly and therefore to the people of Scotland. The Commissioner will be directly accessible to patients to hear their experiences about what could have been better. People sharing their stories will be key to making this role work and making healthcare safer for us all. The Commissioner will focus their attention on the concerns that patients tell them matter most, listening to patients' accounts of their experience and combining these with data from other organisations to identify systemic safety issues and to recommend improvements. The Commissioner will not necessarily be the person who is best placed to investigate every concern that patients raise with them, nor are they intended to take on and resolve individual complaints. There are already well-established processes for these functions that are delivered by other organisations such as health boards, the Scottish Public Services, Ombudsman. The Commissioner will hand over to them where this is appropriate, but we are proposing that the Commissioner has substantial information gathering and investigative powers for situations where they wish to look further into an issue that other organisations such as Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman are not better placed to take on. And I look forward to answering questions from the committee and to this morning's discussion. Thank you, thank you, Minister. I'll, I'll kick off because I think that you've, you've, you've mentioned in your opening statement about what the Patient Safety Commissioner is not going to be. It's not going to be about handling individual cases. Um, and you've mentioned um, other avenues that patients might go through to have any concerns met. Why, why, is there, why is there a need for a patient safety commissioner, given that we have all those other bodies that, that patients 
could go to if they have concerns? I mean, what, what's the overarching need? I'd like you to articulate that. So I think it's very clear, particularly from the Cumberland Review, but we've had experiences prior to that where we recognise that the patient's voice has not been heard. And I think there are very obvious examples of that. If I think about the, the mesh, um, injured women, the valproate, um, injured families and um, infected blood. Those people um, made many years of representation trying to get their voice heard um, and weren't heard by the system. So I think there is clearly a role for a commissioner who will ensure that the patient's voice is heard and will ensure that when concerns are raised, particularly those systemic concerns, that it's picked up on and acted upon. And I think that will give all of us confidence and safety. There's lots and lots of work goes on right across the NHS on safety and on quality improvement. But this, I think, will give us all confidence that patients' concerns are being heard and acted upon. I'm interested in how you're going to evaluate the the, the vote. You know, what once we, we've got the patient safety commissioner in place, how the government's going to evaluate this, the, the success and how how that's that's going. So I think there be I mean there'll be a strong role for Parliament in scrutinising what the commissioner does, and I think um, patients have been very clear with us that they want, and I'm, you know, I mentioned that in my opening statement, they want a role that is distinct from the NHS and distinct from government. They want um, somebody other than government to be scrutinising what is happening in the NHS. So I think there'll be a strong role for Parliament and therefore for the people of Scotland. There are other commissioner roles which we can look to to see how they function, but there's also a similar role with a slightly narrower remit being developed in England, um, which we will also be looking to to see how that works um, in order to find the best way forward for our patient safety commissioner in Scotland. And we, we, we heard from the, the patient safety commissioner in, in, in England and, and um, it was very useful hearing from her and also from Baroness Cumbledge as well um, about you know some, some of the things that they found in setting up that, that role as well. And I think my colleagues might come into that later. I'm going to hand over to Tess White. Tess. Thank you, convener. Um, morning, Minister. Morning. Um, some submissions in the committee's call for em evidence emphasise that patient safety would be better served by investing in safe staffing levels, and we did explore that in some detail. And doctors, for example, undertake um, twice the recommended limit of patient contacts each day by currently poor workforce planning. So how do you envisage, as Minister, the com Commission's safe staffing and given the implications for patient safety. So we have a lot of work going on in government and in the NHS to establish safe staffing, staffing levels and work going on to um, ensure that our workforce is developing in a sustainable way for the future. Um, I think that is a slightly separate issue from, from the Patient Safety Commissioner. I mean, I know that each time when safety um, it is highlighted that can be a contributing factor. But if I think of, I mean, just think of the examples that I gave in, in my earlier response um, the mesh injured women, the valproate injured families, and the infected blood. Safe staffing wasn't an issue there. There was a problem in that these injuries happened and the system did not listen to them. And I think the primary function of the safety commissioner will be to make sure that the patient's voice and concerns are heard. I don't know if you, um, either of my colleagues, want to add any more about um, safe staffing. Maybe, maybe just to, to add as well that um, the kind of impact on staffing on safety, if that was something patients felt was an issue and they were raising that with the commissioner, that is something that would be within the scope of the Commissioner's role to, to look at if they wanted to. It would, it would obviously be up to whoever is appointed to decide whether or not to take that on. Thank you. And then my second question, I will have to read, read this because the list is quite long. Um, Minister, in Scotland we have the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. 
the NHS Incident Reporting and Investigation Centre, Health Improvement Scotland, professional regula regulatory bodies such as the GMC, the Patients' Rights Scotland Act 2011, the Patient Advice and Support Service provided by Citizens Advice Scotland, and the Scottish Public, Public Service Ombudsman. So will the Commissioner, in your view, create duplication in this saturated patient safety landscape? Yeah, so, so I, I think actually um, that illustrates just why it is a valuable thing to develop the role of a patient safety commissioner because it's a complex landscape with lots of people working in that area. I mean, I'm a, I, I have personal experience of working with the Scottish Patient Safety Programme when I was a clinician. It's a very different role to the ombudsman. Um, but patients don't necessarily understand that complex landscape. And I think the role of the commissioner will be to help them to navigate that complex landscape, to make sure that their story is heard by the right people who can act on their story. Um, and I think that there have been enough incidents of where that hasn't happened for this to be recognised. I mean, patient safety is of vital importance, you know, that first do no harm. Patient safety is, is absolutely crucial, so I think it's understandable that there are quite so many systems designed to um, ensure that care is delivered in a safe way and to investigate when things go wrong. I think that's perfectly reasonable, um, but patients find it quite bewildering and disempowering, and that is the bit that we want to make sure is not the case going forward. I mean, I, you know, and all of you in this committee will have heard stories directly from patients who've been harmed by the system. And we want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. We want to learn the lessons each time. So the role of the Patient Safety Commissioner is very much, I mean, like the GMC and the other professional regulators um, will you know, take action. Um, sometimes the role of the patient safety commissioner, the focus will be different. It will be very much about establishing what happened and trying to help the system to learn from that rather than punishing or taking action against individuals within the system. Good, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Sandesh, you have a question on this before I Yes, on. thank you. Good morning, Minister. Um, I, I want to just pick up on something the convener asked you, which was about evaluation. How will you evaluate whether the patient safety commissioner in year one, year two, year three is doing what we would expect them to be doing? I don't know if you, either of you want to come in on that if my answer wasn't sufficient earlier. Um, I, think, I think maybe just to reiterate the point that the minister made about, you know, that one, one of the things that was repeated again and again when we consulted with patients and the public uh, and in engagement thereafter was the, the kind of importance of this separation between the Commissioner um, Sorry, and the Scottish that, Government. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely true, but how will you evaluate this? this? That was the question. It was about the evaluation. Uh, we understand the concept and the people who have spoken, but how are we evaluating whether they are doing what they're supposed to be doing? Yeah. I mean, I think part of that will come through looking at the, the reports the Commissioner lays before Parliament about their work. I think it's probably difficult to be very specific in this session as to how we will do that, because, because of the Commissioner's independence, there's a really important element of them deciding what their priorities are based on what patients tell them, and then using that to inform how they will carry out their role, so there will be an element of kind of... I suppose looking to see what the Commissioner themselves um, sets out as to what their priorities are in the kind of early days of their job and then there's probably something for the Scottish Government to to look at after that. Um, that being said, just kind of reiterating again what the Minister said about um, you know seeing Parliament as the kind of primary means of, of holding the Commissioner to account through their responsibility to the people of Scotland. Independence of the Commissioner, though, fundamentally, doesn't it really that, that effectively Parliament will be, be, be the, the, I suppose, yeah. the, the, the main judge of how this so, is, is going? And I think that's quite 
quite fundamental to the whole idea of the Patient Safety Commission. So absolutely, it? it is fundamental. The idea is that, that it will be Parliament who scrutinise the reports that the Commissioner produces. Of course, they will be of interest to government and there will be action points for us to take note of. But it is really intended that it will be Parliament who scrutinises the information that the Commissioner brings forward, much the same as with, with other. I mean, when I worked as Minister for Children and Young People, the Children's Commissioner was very clear that his role, he was appointed by Parliament and he was accountable to Parliament, mm -hmm. very independent from government, which is what patients are asking for. Okay. Emma, you wanted to come in on this. Yep, thanks, Convener. Good morning, everybody. We heard from um, uh, the Patient Safety Commissioner in England, Dr Henrietta Hughes, and she did a, a first 100 days report, which was part of looking at then what could the remit be or what would need to be explored wider. Is that something that could be used as a way to measure how we take take the, the Patient Safety Commissioner forward and then that can then be reported to Parliament, for instance? Yeah, well, cer certainly. I mean, I would expect this committee to be in involved in how the role develops. I would expect you to you know, meet and speak with the Commissioner. We will, as government, undoubtedly be interested in what the Commissioner has to say and what their early thoughts are on how the role should develop and what the remit of the role is likely to be and what priorities they want to set. But you'll find, I think, as the role evolves, that and, and perhaps each Commissioner will bring a different flavour to the role, um, but it's important that we are, that, 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 that the Scottish people um, hold that commissioner to account. And I'm sure the role will evolve because different projects will be taken um, uh, uh, and then solved, problem solved, for instance. So there might be a way where the, 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 the what works in one session of Parliament might be then different from another or another. And undoubtedly, yeah. and I think we'll see, I mean, we'll be watching, I would imagine that our Commissioner will be looking very closely at what, what is happening um, down south in England and working very closely with that Commissioner to see exactly how they are working and how that role is developing down there. Um, our Commissioner will have a slightly broader remit than the Commissioner in England, who I think is focused largely on, on medicines. Um, yeah. and, and medical devices and medical safety. Yeah. yeah, whereas our commissioner will have a slightly broader role. But I would expect them to look closely at how... I mean, it's, an, it, it's a new role. They will learn in the job. But I think that they will be able to... I mean, the, the point of the role is to listen to patients, hear what they are saying, make sure that the system-wide of healthcare is able to pick up and act on safety concerns that are being raised by patients because we know that in the past that hasn't happened or it hasn't happened fast enough. Okay, thanks. Can I move on to talking about the, the remit? I mean, we've, we've kind of mentioned this uh, quite, quite a bit already, but I'm going to bring in Gillian Mackay. Thanks, convener. Given the, the remit you've just mentioned, Minister, and it being slightly wider than, than the one in England, do you have any concerns about duplication, particularly around the, the medicine side of things and the roles of the two commissioners? And do you think the, the role for the new commissioner here is a realistic one, given its, given its breadth and potential, um, and potential workload? So I, I think it's a good idea. So, mm -hmm. I get, so I absolutely appreciate the challenge and the tension there, mm -hmm. um, and it is tricky. To, it will be tricky to get right, but I think our ambition should be to be as broad as possible to make sure that we can deal with all of the concerns that patients are 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 um, raising. And I think we need to have that. Um, you know, it is as I've said before. It is a complex landscape with lots of different people operating in different ways, I think it is really important to have this patient safety commissioner who will just help to draw all that information together. I don't envisage, I think it will not be the norm for them have to, to have to do inquiries themselves, so I don't think there will be duplication of effort. I would still expect like HIS or the Ombudsman to, to do inquiry, you know, to inquire when issues are raised with them. But I would absolutely expect the Commissioner to be looking at the evidence that they find and pulling it together, particularly helping patients to navigate that complex mm -hmm. landscape, but also picking up on those systemic issues that we think there have been opportunities missed to identify mm -hmm. those in the past. 
Okay. Um, to what extent are you sympathetic to extending the PSC's remit to include acting as the voice of, of staff? Um, do you agree that widening their remit could enable them to get a clearer picture of patient safety concerns, given the ways, the different ways that yeah. things are, are, are raised? Or do you think it risks adding more duplication or potentially sort of streamlining that across to, across so all the different ways? I, I think it should be perfectly possible for staff to raise concerns mm -hmm. and for the Patient Safety Commissioner to listen to that concern. I, you know, I do expect them to be an ear mm -hmm. in the system um, and listening to staff would be a really important part of that. I think we probably um, need to make sure that that's clear, that staff mm -hmm. can do that and, mm -hmm. to, and, and raise concerns and I'm, and I'm absolutely, you know, with, this is stage one of this legislation, mm -hmm. I'm absolutely open to ideas on how we can make sure that that is clear going forward. But yes, I think, I mean, I th you know, if any, uh, essentially I think the Commissioner should be a listening ear. Mm -hmm. It would seem odd to me if they weren't listening to staff. That's good. Thanks, Camina. Julie. Paul. You uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the Minister and um, panel. Um, I, I wonder if I can just expand a wee bit further in terms of where this remit might go. Um, social care, obviously, a very hot topic, uh, a topic of, of significant interest to this committee. We have Dame Sue Bruce's work ongoing in terms of, of looking at uh, social care and, and kind of the regulation of social care. I mean, have you factored that sort of view into your planning, and do you think this might... Given, given all that's going on in social care, have a role in terms of uh, regulation within that context? So I think, well, well, certainly as social care develops, patient uh, safety of individuals, and, and I guess there's the tension, are the patients when they're in social care? Mm -hmm. um, so, so our role is with the Patient Safety Commissioner is very focused on patient safety. I think that as social care develops, they're looking very carefully at some of the systems that are focused on safety that are used in the NHS to build them in going forward. I think, though, at the moment, um, the, the focus should absolutely be on health care. It shouldn't cover social care at the moment. I think if they were to broaden it um, to cover so social care as well. I think the, the role may well be too broad initially and we would lose the essence of what the Patient Safety Commissioner is about. So I think that would be the concern there. It's, so what I'm detecting there, uh, Minister, is that there's a there's an openness, though, I think, uh, as um, social care develops and indeed as the role develops, to, to consider those things and that very much there can be a, a conversation, I think, in that space. I, I mean, I, I, th I think there will be a conversation as we go on. I mean, I look at, you know, like what I mentioned already, the Scottish Patient um, Safety Programme, and that's a, a really effective sort of quality improvement um, improvement methodology that is used within the NHS to empower co-face clinicians to improve the system that they work in. Now, I think we would be crazy if we didn't... It's such an effective method of improving patient safety. I think we could use that in all sorts of other systems. And, the, you know, when I, again, when I was Minister for Children and Young People, they've started to use similar methodology in care for children and young people. Now, I think that as we build going forward a new national care service, we need to think about safety and we need to think about quality and how to build that in with the bricks so that the system can continually be improving itself. But I'm not sure that the role of the Patient Safety Commissioner, which is essentially about ensuring that when people are harmed and when the system is harming people, that their voice is heard. I'm not sure that that applies to social care at the moment. You wanted to ask about the remit as well? Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, the Minister will know I'm interested in the remit of the, the Patient Safety Commissioner as far as um, advocating for people, advocating for groups of people. Um, you know, for 20 years now, people in the southwest corner of Scotland get their radiotherapy in Edinburgh instead of going to Glasgow. So it's unnecessary travel. And so I'm interested to know whether this may be something a patient safety commissioner could pick up to help advocate for people, listen to people, help support 
the fact that people are, are really upset after 20 years of saying, you know, why am I going to Edinburgh and driving past the Beetson for my radiotherapy treatment? Is this something that maybe the Patient Safety Commissioner could um, could help advocate and listen and support a specific group of people f like I've just described? So I think the role of the Patient Safety Commissioner will need to be very focused on patient safety. Um, and, and that will have to be um, the main focus of that individual. I think what you're describing to me is perhaps systems with a lack of patient centeredness. Um, so sometimes, and I, you know, I'm very passionate that our NHS should be person centered, but sometimes we find that people are having to travel long distances, past services that are already there. It doesn't make sense to them, um, but that doesn't necessarily introduce a safety risk. Um, and I think that our patient safety commissioner is going to have to be very focused on safety. Um, it, is the, it is fundamental um, to the role. But yes, I think there are perhaps other ways that we can look at, at making sure that that patient centeredness um, for the system, you know, that all the work that happened on realistic medicine, um, which is essentially about getting, you know, high quality person centered care in the right place at the right time with the patient, a, a, a shared decision maker in their care. That is absolutely what, what we are striving for um, delivering in our NHS. And just a wee quick sup. Um, Matthew McClelland, when we had a previous session, talked about direct links between safety and care and compassion. and. Um, and thought that the Patient Safety Commissioner could play a role in encouraging grown-up conversations about the risks and benefits of medical interventions and, and different things. But I, and I agree that also at the same session that Dr Chris Williams from the Royal College of GP said that safety needed to be the focus, uh, uh, at mm -hmm. least initially, so that we can target the safety issues um, rather than what I've described. So... I think, I think you're right about that care and compassion, though. And we brought in, I mean, I, I guess, a duty of candour in 2018, wasn't it? And, and one of the things that that's given us is this, well, candour, it does what it says on the can, that, that trying to remove the defensiveness and hostility that sometimes is put forward when patients are trying hard to understand what has happened and why outcomes have been the way that they are. This patient safety commissioner, we very much want their role to be on inquiry, helping the system to learn um, and to, to look honestly and openly at what has occurred and try to learn the lessons compassionately to ensure that that doesn't happen to future patients. So, I would say that that care and compassion, there's also probably a role for helping people who've been bereaved or, you know, in, in, in terms of understanding what has gone on. I can see that that would be a powerful role for the patient safety commissioner. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, now um, I'll move back to Paul Kane. Hey, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, I think we're interested in um, the kind of appointment process and, and what alternatives were considered. We've heard evidence uh, from the English uh, Commissioner in terms of it being a part of government, uh, being a department of government, and, and a view there that that uh, allows it not to be overlooked. Uh, however, I think the converse to that in terms of the, the, the bill before us is actually about the independence and the importance of the independence of the role. So I wonder if I can just get your rationale uh, for, for, for choosing that, that direction. Yeah, I think um, when we asked that question, I think the, the, the answer that came loud and clear from people who had been affected by safety issues was that they wanted that independence of the role. That another organisation that was either part of the NHS or part of government um, was not going to cut it, basically. Um, and that someone who was there primarily for them and accountable to the people of Scotland um, was, was going to cut it. Um, and I can absolutely understand that. I can see, I can see 
the pros and cons of all sides, but I think it's really important. I, I, I agree that, that the independence from government and, and from the NHS itself, I mean, we're all MSPs, we'll have mailboxes full of people who say, you know, they're marking their own homework, they're investigating their own, and they just don't have trust in the system. I think it's really important that people who come to the Patient Safety Commissioner can trust and have confidence in the process. And I think that independence from both the government and the NHS will help that. Thanks, uh, Convena. I mean, I mean, I think we, we would certainly recognise that <clears throat> from evidence that we, we've heard. Um, but, but I wonder to what extent do you feel that um, that Commissioner sitting where it does will have the right powers? Because I think what people want to see is uh, a resolution. Uh, mm -hmm. And very often that would involve some end point of action, if, if you understand. So I, I wonder, do you feel that the, there is enough powers there in terms of exerting pressure on government or, 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 or pushing for changes to policy in, in the NHS and that, that important learning that has to happen where there have been issues? I, I mean, I, 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 I'm bound to say I think we have got the balance right on that. Um, I, I, I can understand where your questioning is coming from. I think it's difficult to get that right, but I suppose... One of the key things, as I've mentioned before, is we don't want this to become another organisation that's looking... Um, well, well, the last thing we want is anyone looking to apportion blame. What we want from the Patient Safety Commissioner role, the two absolutely key things, is one, for the patient's voice to be heard, and secondly, for the system to learn lessons. Um, and I think that's really key. I think we've got enough powers to make sure that they can inquire and take action and that government has to listen to them and there's power you know there's an accountability to parliament but i guess as with any new rule there will be lessons learned and evolution as we go along i wonder if i can convener just to push that a little further in terms of you know everybody wants to to work in a really collegiate you know fashion to ensure that there is the encouragement of change i suppose and learning of lessons but where that that doesn't always happen because in large organizations it can be difficult often to get to that end point of change of process or or, or taking the learning on board do you feel there's enough ability to enforce and, and i know that's not a word that it, you know we always like to use because we do want to see as i say that collegiate approach but you know, in social care, for example, we would we would recognise enforcement as, as happening in the care home sector or, or those sorts of places. Do you do you see that there's enough power to enforce if that's required, or or, or any power to do that? So I think there are. I mean, there, <coughs> there are powers to enforce in other parts of the system. So the the professional regulatory bodies can take action. The police can take action if there's a police concern. There's a number of different bodies other than the commissioner who can ensure that enforcement occurs should it be needed. I think the key thing from the Commissioner is for the system to learn lessons. Um, and I think that we have a responsibility. Maybe if we look at, again, you know, if I go back to what I think of as often those big issues which have been raised with us, so the mesh injured women, the Valparate families, the infected blood, those people were asking for a long time for their story to be heard and for explanations and inquiry to be to be made they didn't necessarily want blame apportioned or, you know in fact in fact the the infected blood people were very keen to just have an apology and an acknowledgement um, so i think that the, that that actually ensuring that the system learns is a powerful thing, um, ensuring that it's that issues are picked up and dealt with. I think that really is a very powerful thing because we can see so many examples where that hasn't happened in the past. There's a number of um, colleagues wanted to ask questions on powers. Can I bring them in? Yeah. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, David, you have a question. Please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister, and good morning to panel members. And evidence to a committee um, they were expressing that the Patient Safety Commissioner should have these additional powers and regulatory powers, and you've just answered that you don't think so there. Will people take heed and take note of the Commissioner's recommendations if you don't have these powers? Well, uh, uh, yes. Um, I mean, the, the Commissioner will have power to require organisations to provide evidence. Um, they are 
those are robust powers. I mean, really, I suppose if I explain that this is a, it really is um, a role that is encouraging a culture of openness and inquiry, and, and it's absolutely in the system's best interests to adopt that culture. So that's how we're going to give the best patient care. If we don't learn when mistakes happen or when safety issues arise, we are not going to manage. We know mistakes will be repeated. Which is not in the, it's not in the patient's interest. It's not in the system's interest. So I think there will be enough power. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm open to suggestions if you think that, are, that there are powers that need strengthened. Um, I'm, I'm listening and I'm open to it. Um, but I, I, I would like to think it would be, you know, it's very clear how this role evolved, that there is a, a wish and a will within the system to learn those lessons, to prevent further harm. I was just wondering, because the Care Inspector and the Health and Safety Executive have got powers, I'm just wondering if the, um, the Patient Safety Commissioner will actually evolve into having powers like that. I mean, we need to be careful that we're not duplicating powers that are already there. You know, I said there's lots of, you know, the regulators can take action against individual professionals. There's the police. There's, you know, various um, potential to take action. So we need to make sure that we're not duplicating effort. The fundamental um, role of the Patient Safety Commissioner is to make sure that the patient's voice is heard and that that open learning culture is fostered so that the system learns and prevents further harm rather than these things going on for far too long and harm continuing while those issues unfold. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Sweeney, you have questions uh, on yeah, this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, in discussion uh, in evidence at committee from Dr Henrietta Hughes, the Patient Safety Commissioner for England, we did uh, discuss this issue about Escalation. Um, mm -hmm. So, where I've recommend, you know, the, she was emphatic about the need for collaboration, a culture of openness, not being this kind of uh, inquisitor that would come in and sort of berate people for failures, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an important insight to, to sort of note. But there may well be issues where there have been egregious, you know, problems, and there will need to be very clear um, recommendations that ought to be implemented. And in those situations where there is a mechanism for in escalation. Um, where there's an area of injustice or something needs urgently addressed, which couldn't simply be left to, you know, collegiate um, encouragement. Maybe there isn't a need for that kind of um, process. And, and she certainly came back and said that it was quite early days. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily be clear in my own mind about what the next step of escalation would be in that instance. Obviously, the report line in this case is to Parliament rather than to ministers. So, mm -hmm. um, I just wonder if the minister may have a, a view on how the bill might define better that process of potential escalation, if there is that lack of cooperation in future? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am open to proposals around this issue, and I think it may be an area where, as the role beds in, that evolves if it becomes a challenge for the Patient Safety Commissioner to um, <coughs> ensure that, that organisations take account of what they're saying and, and report accurately and take those achievable actions. Um, so um, I am open to the to the idea that, the, that, it, that it might need more. I think though the bill as, as we've introduced it allows for um, dialogue on the best way forward. There's a, a potential for that collegiate working which I think generally is the best way to enable that op openness and, and learning. But I, yeah, I, 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 I can understand um, that there is concern around that. I do think that I genuinely believe the Patient Safety Commissioner adds something, though, to the landscape. So there's lots of people who are able and lots of organisations who are able to take action. Mm and able to take punitive action and able to, you know, hold organisations to account, I think the Patient Safety Commissioner offers something different. And as I say, when I think of those big tragedies where 
patients' voices weren't listened to and their stories weren't heard and action wasn't taken soon enough. That's the kind of systemic issue that I am absolutely certain that the Patient Safety Commissioner will be able to pick up on. Thanks. And just, if, if I may, um, Dr Hughes did mention multiple paths already exist in the healthcare system. For You mentioned the police earlier, mm -hmm. Minister, for example. Um, she mentioned it's understanding the powers that others have, but also for others to understand the powers that exist in the system to work collaboratively to try and yep. achieve the common goal. Um, so with that in mind, and bearing in mind this is a report laying into Parliament rather than to Ministers, um, do you there's provision within the bill for there to be a sort of assessment period after a certain point in time to see how this works in relation to our organisations and, if necessary, further define through secondary legislation those kind of interactions and those those interfaces? Is that something that might be something this committee could consider in its, uh, I its report? Um, um, certainly, I think that's something that the committee can consider. I mean, I think it's a really complex landscape and I think it's very... I mean, it's certainly almost impossible for patients to understand the landscape. It's quite hard, actually, even for health professionals to understand people who work in the system. Mm. So I think it is there is um, something about making all of these slightly different organisations who have a key interest in safety work together to get the best possible outcome. And definitely, I mean, you know, we're always open to the idea of going back and, you know, looking at whether we've achieved our aim and um, whether, it, whether it's working the way that it was intended and whether it's delivering the best possible results. So I think there is always that opportunity to look again okay. in the future. Thank you. Um, and now we want to turn to uh, the resourcing of the post and the office and questions led by Evelyn Tweed. Evelyn. Thanks, convener. Uh, good morning, Minister and panel. Um, Minister, are you confident the resources proposed for the role are sufficient to carry out the function effectively? I, we, we think so. So, so we think, obviously, the budget is um, appropriate for the Commissioner's proposed remit. The Commissioner is going to be an advocate for patient safety and the patient voice and will be supported by that um, underpinning um, of formal information and gathering powers. But we're not intending them to be a new regulator. We're not intending them um, to be primarily investigative. We would say that largely it will be other organisations doing investigations and the patient Commissioner will work collaboratively with them. So that's how we developed the cost for the financial um, memorandum. And I guess as you scrutinise, as, as Parliament scrutinises the Commissioner's work, um, they will take decisions on whether the remit of the role and accompanying funding needs to change. I suppose that leads on to my next question. In evidence um, from the Patient Safety Commissioner for England, um, the committee heard that it's already expanding its office and bidding for more resources, although Dr Hughes felt it was better to start small and be agile, mm -hmm. um, while having a plan for future expansion and growth. Does the Minister have a plan for expansion and growth here? So I think I'm o I, I am open to it. I mean, I think the Commissioner is absolutely right, start small and agile. There are, it's a brand new role and we need to think carefully about how it develops and evolves. I think that, I mean, I was struck, I think we've gone for about the same size of budget in Scotland as we have, as they did in, in England, so similar sort of numbers working in the team and, and yet there are ten times as many people living in England now. I think that reflects our um, slightly broader remit um, but I do think that we are adequate, we're, well, I'm certain we're adequately resourcing it to start. Um, as we've all said, it is, it is a role that is likely to evolve and it may, we may need to look at that again in future. Um, but I'm certain we're in the right place for starting it. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, just a wee bit more specifically then, Minister. Um, data analytics. That was something that was really highlighted as well by the Chief of Staff too, that, that they really needed to have capacity within that team. And I'm just wondering, I know, I know that you've said already that you know, you'd know you look at 
other organisations, for example, carrying out investigations and the data coming from them. But surely there's a need to kind of pull that all together and really look underneath it. I'm just wondering where that sits at this moment. So, I mean, certainly that is possible. I mean, uh, as a farmer, I'm somebody who loves the data. <laughs> and I think that, you know, it doesn't lie. So if you can get your analysis of data correct, it will tell you a lot about what, what is going on. Um, I think I wouldn't be um, closed to the idea that there may need to be um, a role for somebody with data analysis expertise. I do think, though, so, that that is probably already... I mean, there's the best data ana analysts in, in Scotland are, are in, I would say, healthcare improvement Scotland. <coughs> so, we, you know, we need to be careful about not replicating these roles. We need to understand how the organisations that might already be looking into issues are able to gather data and analyse it and come up with um, understanding and insights into how situations evolve. And I'm not sure we need another organisation with that capacity checking their numbers. But again, you know, I'm, I'm not totally close to the idea. As I said, we will it will evolve with, as time goes on, and um, it may well that may well be. I mean, there's there's hardly a role in any part of government that wouldn't benefit from a bit of data analysis. That, or that public life, because obviously this is this is independent from government. <laughs> so we'd be looking at a situation then, um, I suppose, where we're looking at evaluating and monitoring what's going on there um, mm -hmm. and seeing what the needs are going forward. That yeah, and, and whether that requires somebody, um, you know, there are people with that type of expertise who do a lot of, um, you know, independent um uh, consultancy work so it doesn't it may not necessarily need to be an individual role it may just be that for one situation that expertise is needed and I think there you know there might be capacity going forward to think about that to think about using individuals with specific in expertise um, as the role develops I think that's really interesting thank you Convener. thank you uh, further question on uh, resourcing Sandesh thank you <clears throat> thank you um, I, I want to uh, sort of pick up on on what, what Stephanie um, was talking about as well, because my initial question about evaluation was because of resources. So you were very clear that we need to start off small and agile, and I think that's been agreed by the Patient Safety Commission and people that, that have come to us. Um, but without evaluating whether the Patient Safety Commissioner is doing well, it's difficult to say that they will need more resources or less resources or, or, or whatever we want to say. So, so I wonder if we're able to ask the Patient Safety Commissioner, once they come into post, one of their first actions to be the criteria to which they are evaluated to set that out to start with. Absolutely. I think that will be part of the dialogue when that person's in post. I think there will undoubtedly will all be interested to hear what they think their priorities are and how they intend to measure the outcomes um, and demonstrate robustly to Parliament and to other interested parties that they're doing the job that we intended them to. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and so one of the things that, the Minister, you said was you want patient voice to be heard. Uh, and I am fully aware that the, the Patient Safety Commissioner is not intended to take up individual cases, and you were very clear as well, the Patient Safety Commissioner is not going to be doing investigatory work. Um, but picking up a bit on Emma Harper's previous questions, should the Patient Safety Commissioner and, and their team be listening to individual patients when they have a story to tell, when they have something to talk about, uh, to collate and catalogue the case, to look for that golden thread? Uh, absolutely, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's clear. So there won't be, I think, I mean, it's not that they'll never do investigations. We've given them some investigative powers because we think there might be occasions where it's useful for them to do that. Largely other organisations will do that. Um, and I think, but I do think that listening to individuals is important. I mean, these big tragedies that we've, I've mentioned a couple of times this morning, started with one patient speaking up and then grew. And I think it's really important that the 
patient safety commissioner is able to listen to patients and pick up on that noise from the system, which it seems to me that we haven't got an organisation that is able to do that. Um, you know, when, when these things have arisen before, it's been an individual situation. Nobody's been able to put it together. And I think that the Patient Safety Commissioner will be able to put together that picture and listen to the noise from the system. So that, that's fantastic to hear. Uh, and with that question, I come on to resource, mm -hmm. because that is very labour-intensive. To, to listen to a story, to pull out the thread, to then catalogue it, and then somebody will need to go and check it and see if there are threads that are, are, are coming out. Um, so going back to the question about resource, as the knowledge of the Patient Safety Commissioner grows, as people start to go to the Patient Safety Commissioner, might we see a significant expansion in their budget to simply deal with patients coming to talk to them? So we might. But we might all, and, and again, you know, as I've, as I've said, I'm, I'm open to that possibility. And I think that as the role develops and is evaluated by Parliament, that may well be something that we need to consider as parliamentarians. But it may also be that we find that they develop a really slick way of working with all of the other organisations doing these jobs and it turned, you know, that, that, that they are able to help individuals to navigate the system. And one of the things that's very clear is that individual patients do not know how to get their issues investigated and how to get appropriate resolution from um, a healthcare system. So it may be that it develops in a very slick way, helping patients to navigate the system and ensuring their voice is heard and picking up on those systemic issues that we feel that we haven't been fast enough or slick enough at picking up in, in the past. And again, that just depends on how well they work with all the other organisations in the space. That's key. That collaboration is absolutely key. Thank you. I have one very quick final question. There are people who are very concerned about the cost full stop mm -hmm. uh, because there are lots of patient safety commissioners. What would you say to the people who, who are concerned about this extra cost? I mean, I think we've, it, it, it's a well-established need, I would say. You know, we've, we've um, shown and demonstrated that this, is, this role is absent currently and that it would help to prevent harm. And the types of harm that I would envisage the Patient Safety Commissioner picking up on and preventing are not only you know, devastating for patients to experience, but they're often very, very costly for the system. So I think it's a reasonable investment to prevent harm, and I think that we've established that the system is not currently managing to prevent harm in the way that we would hope it would. Thank you. Paul Sweeney, you have a question on this? Thank you, Convener. Um, we, I raised this back to the point of data, uh, Minister. I raised that point with the English Commissioner um, and asked her, you know, um, there is a huge risk of data inundation having to make sense mm -hmm. of large streams and volumes of information that may be collected for completely different purposes, may not be comparable, may not have the same baselines, etc., and may have accuracy risks as a result. Um, and how do you draw meaningful conclusions from all these different streams of data that would be fed into your office and process it. Um, the Commissioner's view was that having a data and digital function in my team so that we can use and manipulate that data in a way that can bring fresh insight that will help the system to attend and listen to things that it may not have been aware of in the past is key. And also um, the Chief of Staff, um, Dr Duncan, mentioned um, that uh, the Commissioner was right to say that without a data analytics function, the novel insights that a Commissioner could have would be limited. Um, just wondered yeah. if you had a, 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 agreed with that assessment. I mean, I think that's reasonable. What we don't want is for the, pay, the Safety Commissioner to be picking up on noise from the system and that, for that to be dismissed as anecdotal mm. rather than, you know, evidence-based concern. So that does seem reasonable to me. Data, you know, sometimes... Um, 
data is the only way to dispel those concerns about whether you're picking up something that's genuine or whether you're picking up a signal that is, you know, incorrect. Um, so I think there will have to be robust um, capacity for data analysis mm. within it. I'm, you know, I'm not going to write the job descriptions for the various roles within the team mm. right now. There is, there is a lot of data analysis expertise within the system already, mm. um, and I think they will have to complement the work that you're doing, but I get what they're saying in terms of um, crunching the data themselves and mm. developing fresh eyes insights. Uh, uh, you mentioned this opportunity with collaboration across the system um, and I think that was something that was shared by the, the Commissioner I and mean, she did mention uh, that you know a partnership working would have real value here. Um, so I just wonder whether there's an opportunity to further define that within the bill um, to say that our obligations or you know this is where we would expect interfaces to work in, uh, within the system um, whether that's an opportunity. I mean, I, yeah I yeah. think that's a reasonable um, aim for us to have and if it's and if it's not clearly spelled out or well understood, then it's probably worthwhile as reflecting and, you know, seeing if we can refine it any further. I don't know if um, if you want to say anything, Will, on that, but certainly it seems reasonable that we try to, if, if there are concerns that it isn't clear how they would collaborate, then we'd want to make sure that the bill is clear. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think the bill, from memory, I think it does set out at least a couple of instances in which... Um, the commissioner and organisations like his are expected to, to sort of cooperate with each other, but um, the minister said we'll consider whether that can be further kind of elaborated on and clarified. Okay, th thanks very much for that. And I think the point you hinted at earlier, minister, was important as well about um, can often hear qualitative insights from patients. I mean, I think of the mesh um, in, uh, scandal, for example, where it was a petitions committee of the parliament that actually unpacked a lot of that mm -hmm. because um, the system just didn't respond. You know, doctors were were dismissing patients as mm -hmm. you know it was it was um, psychosomatic or it was imagined. Uh, I mean, there wasn't actually a data signal being transmitted through the healthcare system to illustrate there was a problem. So I no. guess that might be a, an, an opportunity whether the, it's possible for the commissioner to actually instruct gathering of data. Or uh, although the mesh scandal yeah. has changed the way that medical devices are um, monitored and information is gathered about them so there's much tighter systems and because of the mesh scandal there's better systems in place there you know with medication there's um the yellow card system will pick up um signals but there wasn't um quite the same level mm -hmm. of robustness about um picking up on issues related to medical devices um, I mean, I, I, I look at that. I'm, I'm Women's Health Minister. There's a reason that Scotland has a Women's Health Minister. Women face health inequalities because of our inequality in power, status and wealth. And many of the issues that we are talking about are because women haven't listened to mm -hmm. when we come forward with concerns. Um, so... We absolutely need to recognise that that is the case and make sure that the system is picking up mm. on that. But there's there's been a great deal of work put in to improve the post-surveillance of devices once they've been implanted. But there is... Um, I, I, I think you've touched on something there in your line of questioning okay. that, that troubles me about how the system currently listens to people raising concerns mm. and who we find easy to ignore mm. and dismiss and who we pay attention to. And, and the patient safety commissioner role will undoubtedly mm. be key to making that more equitable. Do you think, Minister, that to kind of go back to that slightly at that point about powers, that that might be an appropriate element of compulsion for the, the commissioner to exercise where it's instructing, say, health boards to gather certain types of data um, based on perhaps complaints that, sh that, that are being picked up that we can't verify through data. Is that maybe a mechanism where the commissioner could say, look, we really need to start assessing this at primary or secondary care interfaces to understand more? Is that maybe something that could be I mean, defined? I think, I, I think that is a, a reasonable... Um, that may be something that they ask them to provide evidence on or, or try to improve the system around, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tess, you had a quick question on this before I move on to yes, the final thank you. theme. Um, thank you, Convener. So, Minister, focusing on, 
on the positive, do you think there could be a role for the Patient Safety Commissioner where there are good practices in one part of the Scottish NHS and that he or she could help spread that across the whole of the NHS? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, we all, we're, we're, there are pockets of brilliant practice all over Scotland in so many areas. And one of the challenges we have is making sure that that practice is, is the same <laughs> all over Scotland, making sure that the same um, quality and safety focus happens everywhere. So, yes, I think um, that, that would be a, a good outcome. I don't see that as one of the primary ones, because remember, this, this role is absolutely focused on the patient voice. Um, but yes, where they find um, good practice, that might be one way of improving the situation if they found a safety concern in one part of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to the views of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Emma, you have some questions. Yep. Thanks, Convener. Um, it was interesting to read, Minister, that the, the Scottish Parliament's corporate body used language that said the process is complicated but we're moving into a period in which it's becoming regarded as a casual thing to suggest and implement the establishment of another commissioner. Um, it's not the language I would have used because I think patient safety and addressing and preventing harm is um, absolutely reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a former nurse working in a high situation where there was issues in the operating theatre. So I'm interested to know, Minister, what what would you say to the evidence that was submitted also to this um, the Finance and Public Administration Committee that the establishment of a new parliamentary commissioner or commissioners is becoming a casual thing and and which takes in account or insufficient account of the associated budgetary consequences for the Scottish Parliament corporate body. So I'm asking this on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. I mean, I guess I'm bound to say this is a, a, an area that I feel personally very passionately about, not simply because of my role as Public Health Minister and Women's Health Minister, <laughs> but, but also because of my professional background. And I can see the need for a role like this and I can see the need for somebody who is independent of the systems that are already there. So I think there is a very powerful need for this role and for this role to be accountable to Parliament. Um, I won't pass comment on all of the other commissioners, <laughs> which um, may be where they're, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I, I think it's, un I think this one is undeniable. Um, need for it. Um, in terms of the budget and the concerns about the budget, I mean, I think that is a worry for the this, this Scottish Parliament corporate body. And that's one of the reasons for starting small and trying to be agile, is to allay those concerns that they're not taking on a huge resource and to ensure that they're, you know, they're not, the Parliament isn't going to have to become a regulatory body. Um, with you know a vast web of actions right across the NHS. This is a specific role. It's it is very focused on patient voice and patient safety, and we'll see how it evolves with careful evaluation as time goes on. Okay, thanks. Um, just a final question. Um, in addition to we've got six commissioners and an ombudsman, and then with the, the potential of future commissioners. Do, does the Scottish Government um, need to look at how we ensure that a strategic or a more strategic approach is taken to resourcing and establishing additional commissioners? Is, is there work that's been done right now to, to look at that? I mean, I think but perhaps... Could, I mean, this commissioner's role actually uh, as well came from the Cumberland report, so it, was in, you know, it wasn't... It wasn't government that came up with it or the parliament that suggested it, as with many other commissioners, there was really solid um, reasons to bring forward this commissioner's role. Um, looking at them as a whole strategically, I think I think there probably is. There's, there's always room, uh, and often that happens around budget time, um, for looking at where the government's focus is and what 
resources are are going where um, in terms of the whole government's focus rather than this individual commissioner. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have asked all the questions we want to ask. I want to thank the Minister and her officials for the time this morning. Um, we'll take a, a very short pause to allow them to leave. What I'm suggesting is that we take item four of our agenda, which is subordinate legislation, next before we have a, a break uh, in advance of our panel on women and girls in sport, if we're happy to do that. Thank you. Right, so I'll just keep going. Um, the next item on our agenda is consideration of two negative instruments. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered these instruments at its meeting on the 21st of February 2023 and made no recommendations in relation to either instrument. The first instrument is the Public Health Scotland Amendment Order 2023 and this instrument amends the Public Health Order uh, Scotland Order 2019. The instrument allows Public Health Scotland to make arrangements for the vaccination or immunisation of persons against any disease. The policy notes accompanying the instrument state that this is a required due to the expansion of the role of Public Health Scotland in vaccination and immunisation related activities and no motion to annul has been received in relation to this instrument. Do any members have any comments on this instrument? No? I propose, therefore, the committee does not make any recommendations in relation to this negative instrument. Does any member disagree with this? No, nope, we're all in agreement. Thank you. The second instrument is Personal Injuries NHS Charges Amount Scotland Amendment Regulations 2023. The purpose of this instrument is to increase the charges recovered from persons who pay compensation in cases where an injured person receives National Health Service hospital, hospital treatment or ambulance services. The increase in charges relates to an uplift, uplift for hospital and community health services annual inflation. And no motion to annul has been received in relation to this instrument. Do we have any comments on this? No, there are no comments. I propose, therefore, that the committee does not make any recommendations in relation to this negative instrument. Does any member disagree with this? No, we're all in agreement. Thank you. We're going to suspend the meeting now for a break before our next panel. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back to the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee. Uh, we now move on to our uh, first evidence session as part of our inquiry into female participation in sport and physical activity. Um, and I want to welcome uh, to the committee um, Katie Heath and Jenny Snell, who are from the Young Women Lead Committee in the Young Women's Movement, who did a very similar inquiry around about 2019. Um, very good report that's been produced as a result of that. And as I was reading it um, a couple of nights ago, um, it, it very much chimed, a lot of it that was in it chimed with a lot of things that, that, that we heard, which prompted our uh, investigation specifically um, one of the main reasons that we, we were doing this inquiry is because of evidence that we had heard when we did our children and young people inquiry in the first year of this parliamentary term and the issue of female participation in, in physical activity and sport came up quite a lot in our informal sessions with younger women in, in particular. Um, I'd uh, like to ask you, um, I mean, I know what prompted us to do this but of all the things that you could have chosen to focus on I mean there are so many things you could have focused on why was this the one that you, you honed in on? Yeah so um, thank you first of all really, um, for inviting us along today I um, really appreciate the opportunity to share the findings um, with you um, so for for me the the reason that we um, decided to explore um, young women's barriers to participation in sport and physical exercise was that as part of the Young Women Lead programme, um, every young woman that took part in that process shared their kind of key barriers, their key thoughts, their key ideas around what the needs of young women were in Scotland at the time of applying for that voluntary programme. Um, and sport was something that was quite... Um, cleared across all responses. So there was a number of other topics that we did explore, but we decided on um, young women in sport because we thought it was a manageable, manageable topic within the six month timeframe that we had for the inquiry. Um, and then it also kind of tied into wider inequalities um, that covered the other topics that we were exploring. So some of those ideas were around um, eating disorders or around um, yeah, young women's nutritional kind of food experiences. So it kind of the young women in physical education and sport tied into to all of that. Yeah, I um, I think just to add, there was some interest around um, sort of barriers to socioeconomic backgrounds, but also um, some ideas around schooling. And it just felt that looking at that from a sport angle was a way to bring in a lot of interest of such a diverse group and start to maybe bring together a number of inequalities that we were seeing and seeing how those interacted with one key subject. Yeah, because you're right, it's it's not just about sport, it touches on so many other areas as well. You know, what you've mentioned, body image in particular, I know your report mentioned the impact of social media, mm -hmm. that, that has an, an effect on that as well. Now, obviously, you, in a, in a way, are your own focus group because you're, you're young women, you're coming with those experiences. For us, um, well, with the exception perhaps of, of, of Gillian, and I hope I'm not offending anyone, um, you know, it's a long time since I was a, a young woman. Um, and we are specifically, we're not just about young women, we're about women's and girls' uh, participation, so we're not just looking at young women. But in terms of, I, I would like to get some of your, maybe so your advice to us about how we can really hear from the voices of young women to inform what we do here. I mean, obviously we're doing a number of outreach events, with, um, but in terms of, you know, I'd be really interested to know from you, how you went a, a, around engaging with people, what advice you would give to us? One of the, the key things for us was understanding, you know, as young women, how we communicate with each other and a large part of that is done through social media. Um, it's where a lot of us get our news, it's where a lot of us get our political understandings, but also how we interact largely with each other. So we thought it was important to reach out to people through that because we thought we could access a more diverse range of people than just um, who we had in the room. We also knew it was crucial to interact with sports and local community groups. So a big part of the work that we did was understanding how we could reach out to community groups that we saw um, shown best practice and getting the sort of lived experiences of other people because we're very aware of the fact that we don't necessarily represent the views of all young women in Scotland and 
as much as we can we tried to to reach out to as many groups as we could and we also found that schools and um, things like girl guiding were a really good way to get a lot of diverse opinions um, and I think um, worth noting as well, so I was part of the Young Women Lead cohort that looked into this inquiry but have since um, became the CEO of the Young Women's Movement as well. So in terms of the organisation as a whole, the process that we take to our work with young women and girls is to, to ensure that those voices and experiences are centred. So we have um, a kind of participatory led um, research process that we do all of our, our research programmes with, so in terms of our status of young women in Scotland, annual research that we do every year, um, in terms of our young women know and young women lead processes, we ensure that all of those are co-designed with and kind of for young women and girls, so that taking that intersectional lived experience, young women led approach is something that um, we've kind of modelled and practised in a lot of different programmes and researches, and that's something that I would encourage, you know, in terms of thinking about what other organisations are out there in terms of, we focused a lot on protected characteristics and um, in terms of the survey, we didn't get a lot of responses from um, young women from black and ethnic minority mm. communities, but yes, we know that. that there is a massive issue in terms of young women from black and ethnic minority communities accessing sport. So there is that sort of, due to the time limitations of our project, we weren't able to do that targeted outreach with those groups. But um, I think in order to get that really strong, strong, robust lived experience of young women and girls using organisations that are already working in those spaces and have that expertise in youth-led models, participating models, intersectional approaches is something that um, I would encourage. I'm, I'm going to ask you, someone yesterday when we were doing our out outreach said, don't make any assumptions. But obviously the very fact that you decided to do this because of you know a lot of the experiences of people in, in your, your, your group, but as you did that outreach and as you're putting your report together, was there anything that came out that surprised you? Was there anything that you hadn't anticipated at the start? Or I'm asking two, two, two on the spot question. Um, I, I think we obviously had a perception that there were barriers mm -hmm. to sport from, from our experience. I think we were shocked at how much um, your socioeconomic background impacts your ability to access sport. I think we assumed there would be an, an impact, but 81% of the people who responded to our survey indicated that as a key barrier to them. Right. And that was really quite disheartening. Um, and I think that was something that, while we thought there would be an impact, we were surprised by just, just how big that was. Just how big it was. Yeah. And I think that's something that's quite crucial to, to consider as well as part of, of this inquiry is because we did this report pre-pandemic um, and pre-cost of living crisis as well. So that 81% now would you could make an assumption that it'll be much, much higher in terms of um, young women specifically facing disproportionate impacts of the cost of living crisis and the kind of additional barriers they'll face to access and sport when service provisions have closed down during COVID as well. So um, there's yeah, definitely a kind of an increase in that. So although that was really shocking and startling then, I think that would be even higher a stat now. OK, thank you very much. I'm going to let, let my colleagues in. Uh, Sandesh, you have a question on the report. Yes, it, um, my question is really focused about the, the, the methodology and uh, in no way am I trying to attack you, but I am trying to ascertain um, how things, how you got to where, where you've got to. So um, when it came to your uh, advisory group, um, what was the ethnic minority mix and the religious mix within that group? The, the group of young women who were part of the Young Women Lead programme. On, on the actual advisory group, yes. Yeah. Um, so I don't have the specific stats um, with me today. Mm -hmm. um, I, could, I could make a guess. It was a very diverse group. We did have diverse representation on the group, but I can um, definitely follow up with an email afterwards in terms of yeah. the actual breakdown, if that would be um, useful. Yeah, abs absolutely, please. For, 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 for the, the minority ethnics and also yeah. the religious, um, if appropriate. Um, one of the things, so you, Jenny, you've already spoken about the small number of responses from people from an ethnic background. Um, sample rate was too small, um, the focus group, I'm um, sorry, uh, uh, and, and also too small to talk about religion and belief. You reached out to the girl guides, um, but they're not particularly ethnically diverse. So mm -hmm. could you maybe explain, if you're going to reach out to a group like the girl guides, but you don't have ethnic data, 
I, I don't fully understand how, how you, you didn't then reach out to another group. I, th I think um, for us, one of the key things and one of the limitations of this was that there were six meetings overall. And during that time, it was a voluntary um, group where we had young people who were still of school age, still attending school. We had people working full time, we had mothers, and we had limitations to the time in which we, we had the report and, and the time in which we could do the research. A lot of the research that we therefore could do were based on the particular links that we had directly in the community. So it just so happened that someone within the group had a link to Girl Guiding, had access to be able to set up um, a bit of a focus group in a really short period of time, um, already had sort of um, approval, to, approval to do that and already had the links to the group. So that was really the reason why we, we focused particularly on that group. And I think if we had had more time, we would have wanted to follow that up by reaching out to, to more groups and making connections. But we felt we weren't able to do that fully in that time. Thank you. And we we'll move on to questions from Evelyn Tweed. Evelyn. Thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning to you both. And thanks for all your, your hard work so far and for being here today. Um, I was interested in your comments at the beginning there because a lack of access to well-fitting kit, for example, is more likely to impact those from a less well-off socio-economic background. So how do you feel about a proposal that, say, for example, free sports bras might make a difference? Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the key findings we found from the inquiry was that there was a lack of awareness around the best equipment that young women and girls can use within in sports, um, linking specifically to body image as well, you know, in terms of how they feel. We found that um, the kind of key point where young women and girls started to drop off from sport was around um, puberty, so around when they moved from the transition from primary school into um, high school. So I think one of our recommendations was around um, access to, to period pro products, and, and obviously there's been um, progress on that since. But I think further progress in terms of um, increased awareness raising for young women and girls and what support is out there for them in terms of, of kit and equipment, and including like um, sports bras, um, would be really welcome. And also, yeah, um, thinking about that that socioeconomic barrier to the, the costs impacted by that, we found that there was a massive um, barrier to young women and girls' participation in sport because, you know, especially taking part in competitive and elite sports or professional sports, there is a high equipment cost that comes with that. So any additional supports um, in terms of like free products would be. Um, a really kind of welcome progress. Yeah, I think there were really good examples from schools who had put initiatives in place off their own back, um, where we had the there was mention in the report of shoes being used almost like a like a bowling idea where you could come in and take trainers if you needed them, and that it sort of removed the barrier of trying to to seek out perhaps people who we had to provide for. It was a universal offering. And I think that that was quite effective and that it took away a lot of the shame around requiring it. It was just, you know, taken for granted that that was there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would be good to do, to have that initiative in place because you're not relying on individual schools to create that best practice. You're perhaps providing that initiative and, in, in, like, levelling the playing field. Thank you. Gender inequality and sexist attitudes are entrenched from, from a young age, and we know that. Um, I think it's important that the onus isn't on young women and girls to make changes. Do you have any examples for us um, where schools have successfully engaged with young men and boys on these issues? Um, I do personally. I'm actually a school teacher, so um, I know of a couple of initiatives where schools have run equality and equity, equity groups where they have asked... Um, men to be, or young boys to be part of that discussion, especially those in football teams, or um, and they've asked for them to engage on ideas around equality um, and set some ideas around uh, what, how they would like to create a sort of inclusive school community. I think also important is that what was fed into that was a, a sort of focus group with young women um, to understand the barriers that they were facing to physical education and then having a, a sort of awareness given. So. I think there are a number of things happening in schools. I think partially one of the problems is that, that, that there's inconsistency across the board and it's relying on 
um, school teachers to go to have an interest and an understanding of that and that's not necessarily happening on an equitable basis across Scotland. Okay. I think also there's a, a number of um, third sector and, and youth work initiatives happening as well so it might not be part of a formal education curriculum but um, programmes like the Mentors and Violence Prevention Programme and Don't Be That Guy are taking place in schools like led by um, youth work organisations, led by third sector organisations. So um, just as Katie was saying about that equitable approach, I think it's ensuring that there's also a collaborative approach to that as well and not putting the onus entirely on um, formal educators and teachers, but actually sharing information and opportunities to work more joined up and collaboratively across third sector organisations, youth work organisations, schools. To, to kind of bring that more holistic approach to um, education around um, yet yeah, misogynistic behaviours from a young age. Thank you. I bring in Emma. Thank you, convener. Good morning to you both. It's interesting to read the report. I've got a couple of questions. One of them is about um, that there's fun factor recommendations in the in the report because not all women want to be elite athletes and um, and. Obviously, if they do, then we give them support in, uh, in order to develop them. But there is issues around competitive versus just participating for engagement and sport. What did you find in your report uh, uh, about the aspects of competitive versus just participating because it's fun? So yeah, so an, a number of the, the barriers that we found um, for young women and girls, again, it was that transition from primary to secondary school. So in primary school, um, the young women reported that there was a number of um, opportunities for them to participate for fun. But at the minute they transitioned into high school, PE becomes more focused on um, technical skill. It becomes more focused on competitive and competitiveness and talent, um, especially when it was in like you know mixed classes with boys. You know, if, if it's a maybe a more male-dominated sport in terms of football or, or rugby, it becomes very focused on what skill and talent kind of development there is. Um, so there was a, a lot of feedback we got around um, young women um, wanting the opportunity to be able to participate in safe spaces just for fun and to try out new sports like rugby or, or football without that pressure on it being um, too focused on the technical skill development and more focused on the health and well-being aspect that fitness can bring. Um, I think also in terms of community sport, one of the things um, that we found is there's a, a number of opportunities for young boys and young men when they go into secondary school to participate in community-based sports. There's a lot of five-a-side football teams or like local voluntary run sports clubs for boys and young men that tends to not be the same um, for young women and girls so um, there's a number of different compounding factors that would would kind of contribute to that we could look at the lack of opportunities for women to become volunteer coaches within their community for example you know in terms of those pathways into leadership or women who have um, as we've seen in terms of the cost of living crisis got disproportionately impacted by taking on the brunt of child care or um, taken on a lot of the unpaid work so they don't have that same flexibility and free time to go out and volunteer as community sports coaches like compounded with the lack of experience and opportunity they've maybe had growing up in terms of sport and being able to offer that opportunity to young women and girls so I think there is a kind of real lack of opportunity for young women and girls within community spaces to just participate in sports clubs for fun um, and that then becomes very focused on it's as if you're talented, it's if you've got technical ability, it's if you've got skill, and then you can be sort of fed into pathways to competitive sports clubs. Um, but again, that's not for everyone, and also that comes with a number of barriers in terms of how do you access sport clubs that are maybe only in the two major cities, you know, in terms of Edinburgh and Glasgow in Scotland, um, but you're from a rural community in the Highlands, or how do you? Um, afford the equipment that comes with that and the competition cost that comes with that. So um, there was a lot of feedback in terms of creating more opportunities for young women and girls to just be able to participate for fun um, within their communities. And I think there's a, a number of different actions that could be taken to get there in terms of those leadership opportunities for young women into coaching positions at a community level, breaking down the barriers for, for cost implications um, and supporting kind of grassroots community youth work organisations, community based organisations to, to put on those facilities. Mm -hmm. Just a, a question also about um, 
what is offered to young women and girls as far as the type of sport. Um, were you able to determine whether some by local authority, for instance, whether there was a wide variety of offer of sport activity. And you mentioned, Jenny, about like some places might only have um, certain facilities in, in Edinburgh or Glasgow, like the Edinburgh International uh, Climbing Arena, for instance. I know that seems to be quite increasing in popularity now, and a lot of schools have climbing walls and things like that, but in order to maybe compete or even just have fun, um, for me in Dumfries and Galloway, which is also rural, people have to go to Carlisle um, or Edinburgh. But I'm interested in whether an audit of the sports offer was done because, because there's such a variety in like field track, cross country, team sports, individual gymnastics, and like I've had an opportunity to experience kayaking, which I absolutely love although it's a bit scary on the water. But I'm just wondering about whether you conducted an audit of what was offered for young women and girls. Um, so, no, so no, the methodology that we took didn't do a, a kind of a formal audit across local authorities, I think, in terms of the, the intensity and the capacity that that would have required for, for the young women on the programme. That would have been um, too extensive. Um, however, we did get a number of um, kind of feedback from our survey responses. I think there was about 600 young women and girls that we engaged mm -hmm. with um, over the course of the project, um, and they fed back that predominantly the sports on offer for young women and girls differed to that of, of young men and boys. So um, I think, did you have an example of... Yeah, I, th I think um, a, lot of, a lot of young women felt that continuing on from school education that the offer to them felt more limited and that they weren't often offered things like football and rugby because it was considered something that wouldn't necessarily be something that they were interested. So there, we there weren't really the opportunities in school to have tasters of sports to then continue on. And I think that's a real barrier to them being able to go out and try and take on the chance of enjoyment um, and you know be engaged in later life. Um, just going back to that idea of enjoyment, as part of the benchmarks for school, there isn't mention of enjoyment. It's all around skills-based and developing skills. And so there isn't that fundamental understanding of sport being given to you as something that's enjoyable. And I think that, that that continues on into later life. One one place that we saw doing excellent practice was um, Netball Scotland and their Bounce Back programme, which is all designed about for people who have been away from sport for a while and coming back into the sport later on in life. And they have a number of programmes across Scotland and all um, across local authorities. But since COVID, a number of those have um, struggled to reopen. And so we're looking at, again, the impact of that in major cities. So I think... You know, some of the the offerings might again be limited by that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Stephanie, you want to ask some questions on around this theme? Thank you very much, convener, and thanks for being here today. Um, yesterday, when we were out um, having a chat, we we, we heard an evidence that that women and girls want agency and choice around things. Um, Rudy are back, and I hope I've got I've got the pronunciation of that correct there. Um, from Scottish Rugby, spoke about being quite flexible and changing the rules about and different things like that. And rugby, and it being about play and fun and enjoyment, as as my colleague Emma mentioned earlier on there. However, we also heard as well that many girls drop out during those early years of secondary school. Um, again, that's been mentioned today too. And that there seems to be too much focus on organised sport instead of like healthy activity, if you like. Are there examples of teenage girls helping to co-design what's happening at PE in school for girls, or is that something that we should be thinking about? I think there are there are anecdotal examples of that. There are schools who, especially rights respecting schools, who are focusing on participatory approaches, who are making sure that girls are designed and. Um, the curriculum and who are having focus groups and implementing those. But again, I think that's coming back to a lack of consistency. There's no real focus on that being a part of the development of the curriculum and that those, those fundamentally, what we keep coming back to are that the voices that we need to be hearing from are, are the young women and girls who you're, you're looking to engage. They're the best people to be to be speaking to that. And I think that would be something that, if it could be done consistently across schools, could have a greater impact. So maybe we need some richer data on that kind of stuff. We need to make sure that we're collecting that and yeah. using it. Yeah, we've okay. got um, not an example of um, 
young women's participation in co-design around sport and physical exercise, but the young women's movement have been working with NSPCC across Dundee, Perth and Angus on um, a programme called the Young Women No Programme, and that's working with three high schools in, in each of the local authorities to bring together a group of, of young women and girls to co-design resources specifically for teachers, youth workers and, and parents around um, that topic is around healthy relationships. So the young women and girls work with us in NSPCC and safe spaces that are focused on, on wellbeing and inclusion to kind of co-design those resources that are, can then be rolled out across schools for teachers to use in their own kind of practice as well. So that is a model that's worked really effectively in terms of that topic and could be something that's explored um, in terms of sport and physical exercise and PE in schools as well. That's great. Um, just to kind of widen it out a bit there as well too, um, I was reading Make Space for Girls, having a look at their, at their website there, and they're talking about how parks, play equipment and public spaces for older children and teenagers are currently really designed around the default male, and that we really need to start making space for girls, that girls can feel quite intimidated, for example, going into a mugger area, mm -hmm. where it's all high fences and it's a narrow entrance and things like that. So I was just wondering... Um, what your views were on that, and if there are examples again of, of that, that kind of design working for girls and girls being involved in that? Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. So our Young Women Lead Glasgow cohort, cohort actually, in 2021, um, they focused on feminist town planning as their um, kind of place-based inquiry topic. Um, and that um, recommendation from that report was focused on um, adopting a feminist town planning lens to kind of future policies and practice within Glasgow City Council and was passed um, by Councillor Holly, Holly Bruce took it to um, Council and that got passed in October 22 um, and that specific report around feminist town planning which was co-designed by young women and girls focused a lot on um, parks specifically and one of the kind of key things that we found was that a kind of high proportion of young women and girls wanted to use parks and green spaces for physical like exercise and activity, but um, six I think it was yeah like twenty percent don't feel safe in parks during the day, and then that number rises quite significantly um, in winter when the nights draw in and, and darkness as well, and that was due to um, heightened risks of assault, harassment, abduction, you know, violence against women and girls um, because of. The, the lack of lighting within parks because of the lack of security around those spaces, because of the um, things like you mentioned, like having like high hedges and lack of exit and entry points as well. So I think that um, that report was an example of how yeah, young women in Glasgow had, had explored that topic and then um, used that to kind of influence system change at a local level, but could be rolled out across um, Scotland and other local authorities as well to take that feminist town plan and lens um, with young women and girls like meaningfully at the centre of that um, to kind of all local authorities across Scotland. Could I have just have a short final question, convener? Um, just kind of going back to the word play, which again we had a wee bit focused on earlier there, um, about it being really important that, you know, play isn't just something for little kids, it's for teenagers, it's for older children, it's for adults as well too. But there, there also seems to be, you know, um, in the general public as well, when you've got play going on, especially with those older teenagers and people at secondary school, that people are quite negative about that. You know, they worry about oh, antisocial behaviour. When we've opened muggers up um, in some areas in South Lanarkshire, they've been padlocked by mm -hmm. neighbours mm -hmm. who live nearby. Is there a need to really change that attitude and to really put play out there as being something that's really important right across the board and, and change, change the thinking around that? Yeah, I think that's something that came through really clearly. We spoke to the Judy Murray Foundation and one thing that they cited as being crucial um, to getting women into sport was the impact of peer groups and joining sports activities based on if you could get a little group of women coming together, that that's an, an easier barrier in. And the one thing that we noted was that women tend to drop out in groups as well. So the idea of playing, creating that sense of sociable um, sort of fun around, around sport was crucial to get them engaged in, in, in any meaningful way. I think there is a lot of stigma around young people in general that needs to be broken down just holistically across and there's some great youth work practice happening across Scotland and I know that um, Youth Link Scotland the National Youth Work Agency have a number of um, policy responses to things like that as well in terms of how we break down that, that stigma of, of young people in, in, in spaces like parks and green spaces as well so um, yeah I think there's a, a kind of a general need to just destigmatise young people's kind of behaviours in terms of play and in and green kind of spaces and parks. Lots of amazing young people, I couldn't agree more. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Stephanie. Gillian. 
Thanks, convener. So as part of this inquiry, I'm really interested in how we build that sort of movement and sport for life. And I suppose that's probably one of the things that's really difficult with the, the age group that you were that you were looking at. How how do you think we can better facilitate those changes in activities that naturally happen over over people's lives, switching from one sport to another, particularly where that focus on on elite sport and going into and following elite pathways comes in for those those sort of early um, late primary school, early early secondary school um, young people, and how we how we facilitate things like making sure they have the skills to be able to go out for a run or go to the gym, which is most people's weekly way of, of physical activity and just wondering if you had any any views on how we do some of that yeah, I think um, in terms of that that move from primary to secondary school that also coincides with with puberty mm -hmm. from for most and I think a lot of that is tied up in, in body image and issues around access to materials as we mm -hmm. have to already spoken about um, feeling comfortable in the clothes that you're wearing but also having the capacity to feel like you can then go and rejoin your school day or you can interact after that time. And right now, um, I think there was a lot of feedback that we had that um, changing room facilities and the ability to feel clean and hygienic after being in those situations wasn't, was a barrier to why people would refuse to, to take part. I think in terms of like another, another gap that we found was um, as women start to have children, mm -hmm. um, that there's a real drop off there. And there are a lot of great examples of people who are creating diverse and open spaces that encourage women to bring children or have um, really like open spaces where there's childcare facilities mm -hmm. or perhaps classes where you can bring uh, your baby along to get you back into exercise. And I think it's about having that open um, space where, again, you're collaborating with women with lived experience that's going to be crucial. There isn't really a one-size-fits-all, which is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to make a sort of succinct... Um, recommendation because it is there are so many diverse needs there. Yeah, I think just echoing from the, the, the kind of lived experience of, of young mums and or or mums who have just gone back into sport as well. One of the findings mm -hmm. that we found was around um, there's like a really high number of um, women who experience pelvic incontinence after mm -hmm. childbirth as well, and that that is a massive barrier to their participation mm -hmm. in sport, and it can take up to seven years for them to seek help. Um, around that so that's seven years where they potentially won't be accessing any um, physical sport or exercise or, or going for runs and um, thinking back to the, the feminist town planning um, report that we did in, in 2021 that um, highlighted a, a kind of lack of facilities as well within toilet like kind of toilets facilities within parks and green spaces mm -hmm. um, and and you know that again that's another thing that could in the kind of short term be implemented as having the opportunity to you know go and take part in runs or kind of park based exercise whilst having access to those toilet facilities for young mums and um, but also kind of increased awareness around um, and, and reducing the stigma around those kind of women's healthcare issues um, more generally I think is, is required and um, speaking out about those kind of topics and, and issues on social media platforms on kind of I'm thinking of, of Young Scott have some fantastic campaigns just now um, because it's in endometriosis month and yeah. they've got a big massive campaign around that so they'll be reaching lots of young women and girls across Scotland so there's some really great platforms that could be used as awareness raising campaigns to kind of help new mums for example um, you know understand that this it doesn't need to be something that's that's stigmatized or shameful but they can go and get help in something like six I think it was six six sessions of physiotherapy was all it would take to kind of reduce some of that pelvic incontinence and help them mm -hmm. back into sport, but that could be long lasting for seven years. So, um, yeah, more campaigns and awareness raising. Um, we're actually currently at the Young Women's Movement undertaking research around um, women's access and experiences of the healthcare system across Scotland as well. So, mm -hmm. that report will be due to launch at the end of April um, and kind of holistically looks at young women and girls' experiences of access in healthcare. And we'd be happy to share that because I'm sure there'll be mm -hmm. intersections and, and crossovers with this inquiry as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so, you mentioned um, changing facilities and things. What else do you think could be done to improve facilities? Um, I know. I know myself. Some of the some of the activities in Falkirk, for example, take place in some of the high schools after after the school day. Mm -hmm. The lights are off and off in the rest of the school. It's quite an oppressive <laughs> environment to walk into, mostly in the mostly in the dark. Are there any other examples of ways you think we could make 
the actual physical buildings better for women to go and participate? I think there's an element of, while, while spaces are often separate, that there's there would be great to have things like shower curtains in place for areas of privacy. There are mm-hmm. a lot of young girls who stated that as being an issue, that mm-hmm. they just were private people and they, they felt that they, they that was a real barrier to them, mm-hmm. was the actual sort of horror around getting changed in front of a room full of people. And I think there are really small changes that could be made around having the option of spaces to take a little bit of privacy. um, And then, you know, you could still have your open spaces that are are more communal. Um, I think that there are a lot of sort of oppressive and sort of... I think well-lit is important. I think Mm -hmm. it's something that not just in terms of... We've spoken a lot about the fact that sport is really tied to body image and it's it's tied a lot to um how young women view themselves and i think that that is that is a key barrier that we can't underestimate is is how much that that will have an impact yeah i think a lot of the feedback we got was around creating safe spaces as well for young women and that's something that we definitely find across all of our young women's movement programs and, and research is the need for safe welcoming and inclusive spaces or Young Women Lead Fife programme um, just recently on International Women's Day launched their Safe Spaces um, Community Toolkit. So it's a resource for community spaces to create safe spaces for young women and girls. Um, And I think that's something, again, that could potentially be co-designed with young women and girls in school settings. Like, what does an inclusive, safe, welcoming space look like for PE? And what are the lived experiences of those young women and girls in that specific school that might be different to... A school in a different local authority, mm-hmm. or a school in a rural community, or yeah, uh, yeah, different kind of lived experiences of young women and girls. So I think it's like it's not again, it's not a one fit approach to that. It's mm-hmm. it's working with young women and girls, listening meaningfully to their lived experiences, and, and co-designing spaces that work for them um, within their settings. That's great. Thanks, Camila. Thank you, Tess. Thank you. Um, thanks, Katie and, and Jenny. I thought the report was excellent as well. So. Um, Looking at um, your lead report found that communal changing rooms could actually create a barrier and an obstacle to to girls and women, and particularly regarding privacy and being able to be free from harassment. So in your opinions, um, do you think that um, there should be and do you support women-only changing facilities that's the first question and then the second question um do you have any examples of best practice that um provide safe spaces for women and girls changing facilities i don't think in in very many school spaces there would be communal changing spaces for women and and men i think it would normally be like gender specific changing rooms anyway um, I think that the, the kind of key finding that we found from the report was around having the even within a, a, a safe space for women for example in terms of like a, a gendered space um, for changing rooms it was around that lack of privacy even within that space so having privacy cubicles was the key finding we found so I think actually in terms of having new, gender neutral changing rooms that possibly wouldn't even be an issue it's about having the safe space to go into your own private cubicle to get that privacy um, if you need it um, so I think that um, yeah from our findings we didn't didn't find that there was any specific feedback on on that kind of that topic and what's your what's your opinion um, I, I just, in general, feel like I would just like the option of having a, a private a private space. I'm not really... I think um, having the option, I know that in a lot of secondary schools, they have um, sort of male and female changing rooms, but they also then have spaces where you can go if you would like to have a private... But that, again, I think, just to bring back, is all about individual schools and individual, uh, individual teachers taking on the requirements and needs, which obviously... Is, um, is great but some consistency around that would be great to provide spaces where people can go to break out if they would like privacy I think is important yeah, great, I think it needs to be based on um, lived experience again and, and inter- taking that intersectional approach to understand that you know there's lots of diverse experiences of, of young women and, and men accessing sport and that the lived experiences might not be the same as others and taking that sort of diverse intersectional approach is really really necessary great Thanks. And my, my second question, so I'm a, I'm a black belt in karate and I've done martial arts for quite a long time. And I know the risks. There are significant ri- risks with mixed 
sex sparring. So um, in terms of schools, do you think um, that schools should provide single sex um, sports? I think there was um, a lot of feedback that that's the way that young girls preferred to take, to take sports. There were examples where there had been swimming lessons and girls felt more engaged when when they were able to go um, and do that alone. There are examples where there's been sort of team games where they felt that just perhaps there's not an, an awareness of like strength when throwing a ball. And I think that was that was the feedback that we mostly got was that they would prefer to do physical education in school. Um, so like a, in a girl only space, basically. And can I just add, in t one of the topics that we got feedback, we had a session yesterday um, in um, a sports club and was around attitudes of boys and men. So is, in your opinion, is there more that can be done, whether it's schools or sporting, where um, boys and men get more education? Yeah, I think, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, even part of that, that we spoke about a holistic view of how we would take physical education forward in school and the recommendations that we would make around that. Part of that holistic view could be around attitude to sport. And I think there's definitely more that could be done to educate around um, safe spaces and when it's appropriate to be making comments around that, around women's bodies, but also around um, their ability with sport. A lot of the feedback we got were traumatic events where women had, had comments made against them about their bodies, about their ability in sport. And that had completely changed their perception of themselves as, as they grew up and their interaction, even as adults, which had, had really impacted the ability they felt that they could have. Yeah, I think there's also a really increased risk at the moment in terms of that um, misogynistic rhetoric coming through social media accounts, especially in terms of, of influencers. And, and young boys and men are being heavily influenced by that, especially, um, you know, we're seeing it in, in school spaces and playgrounds, you know, that chat that's going on between young boys and men. So there's a, there is a real need for work to be taking place specifically with young boys and young men around what positive masculinity looks like, you know, what... What does it mean to be a, a young a young boy and a young man in Scotland today? And again, there's a, a great programme happening just now um, by No Knives Better Lives um, and the kind of violence reduction unit around around that research of how how do we work with young boys and young men around what that positive masculinity looks like to try and tackle some of that really misogynistic rhetoric that are coming out because um, it is a real risk to young women and girls in terms of that increased harassment, increased violence against women and girls. And it won't just be in sports spaces, but it'll be across across the board. It'll be in, in every sort of aspect of young women and girls' lives. So um, there's a big kind of need to be pushing that education for young boys and men. Can, can I ask about, so, so what might be a joke can be hurtful, what you said can be hurtful to, to women and girls. Have you got, and talking about the education, do you have any thoughts on how it might be done? Yeah, there, uh, there are some great programmes like Basketball Scotland where there are mentors put into schools and very often they are targeted at um, young people who are perhaps having issues with social interaction and the sport is used as a means to build social skills. Um, to sort of encourage teamwork, to encourage positive interactions. And I think that there are real strong ways to provide sporting mentors to both young women and um, young boys that can develop a sense of community and teamwork that, that could be really positive. Good, thank you, thank you. I'd like to have a bit of a convener's privilege and just build on what Tessa said before I bring in Paul. We'll bring in you in a minute, Paul. But I asked yesterday our sports bodies this question and I'm going to ask you the same question. We've got the broadcasters coming in front of us. Now you've talked about social media, but in terms of like how sport and women's sport is portrayed in the mainstream media, in the broadcast media, what, what, would, what would you say to the broadcasters? I don't know if you did have them in front of you, but we do. Um, so no, I don't think we engaged with um, broadcasters specifically, but um, a big piece of feedback through the, throughout the research was that the, the role around role models more generally and, and how young women and girls can see themselves represented in sport and the media has a massive role to play in that. Um, I think there's there's been some kind of great work done already. Um, is it Gender gender Equal Media Scotland, um, which is like a collaboration between women's organisations and media organisations looking at gender equality in the media kind of more holistically, not just focused on, on sport and physical education. But um, I think there's a real need to be challenging those 
those narratives um, in terms of the media. So if I was speaking to them, I'd be asking them to kind of represent women's sport in a, in a fair and equitable way um, in comparison to, to men's sport and to, to really platform and profile um, women's sport. And I think we have seen a, an increase in that in terms of um, women's football, for example, but there are other sports that could still do with getting kind of platformed more frequently um, and raising awareness of the variety and the diversity of, of sports out there in terms of um, that young women and girls can access and also challenge in some of that language that we kind of see when women are being spoken about in sports. It's very different to that of men. It's always kind of, not always, but a lot of the time focused on um, body image or, or what like a tennis player is wearing, for example, in terms of kit, rather than focused on that that person's achievements or that kind of, you know, person's yeah, talent within that situation. It tends to take quite a kind of a, a misogynistic, sexist almost language narrative so there is a lot of work needs to be done in terms of regulating that that language in the media um, and kind of representing women and girls in sport more fairly. Yeah I think just to build on that we did take evidence from the Judy Murray Foundation who have examples in tennis of great female role models who are doing impressive things and are real advocates for the sport but what they said was damaging is that young women would come and, and talk about Serena and Venus Williams and cite them as role models but in the press they were or in the media they were being sort of dismissed and their bodies were being commented and what they were wearing was being commented on a lot of the time just as much as their accolades um, and they weren't necessarily being represented fairly for the achievements that they had created and she said that that undermined a lot of the work that was being done um, to engage women in sport when such clear and impressive role models are, are being diminished in the media. Thank you, it's helpful. Paul, you want to comment on this? Um, thank you, Convener. It was interesting just to follow the, the conversation around um, sex-segregated sport, and particularly in educational settings, and the context in which misogyny can come into, particularly in the, the context of team sports, um, and where you, there's an introduction of competition um, as, as an element of it all. I um, also want, was reflecting on your point about public facilities such as parks and accessibility of that within a feminist town planning perspective. Um, one of the initiatives I think has been quite positive, certainly in Glasgow, has been the Park Run initiative, um, which has been quite successful at seeding sort of community-based sporting activity in otherwise sterile public spaces. Um, in that context, it's a mixed uh, sex activity, and I just wondered, whilst um, y y your point's important about um, appropriate context, depending on the, 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 the type of sport that is involved, um, and then also this idea about tasters, for example, in different sports that maybe aren't traditionally female-oriented. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there is a bit of sort of nuance needed about what might be more appropriate in different contexts? For example, the park run might be an appropriate place for um, mixed settings, but there might be other instances, say swimming, for example, whether Glasgow traditionally had female-only um, swimming evenings, for example, mm -hmm. is there areas where you want to identify where this might be a more appropriate setting than others? Is that, is that something you've looked at? Yeah, I think for a lot of the a lot of the scenarios there are obviously areas where and Parkrun is such a great example of, of um encouraging sort of a mix of abilities and a mix of people in the community. I think there were it's more about choice and I think it's about having the option of interacting in the setting in which you choose. So we looked at a gym called Project Forty Two in Edinburgh who provide, you know, classes which are mixed, um classes which are women only classes which which cater to trans people um, and all of that was about you having the space in which you would like to interact um, and so I think that that nuance is important there that there just isn't a, an opportunity to say that every single sport we could say right that's going to be a gender mix and it's about um, I, I guess taking the time to even think about women when you're designing these these community based projects and how mm. you can make your your sites more inclusive. Yeah, and I think in terms of a lot of the barriers that we're seeing to, to young women's participation in, in sport and physical exercise are, are wider gender equality barriers as well. And actually, we need the safe spaces for young women and girls to build their confidence, to build their skills, to feel included and safe. But that doesn't mean that that's not a pathway into opportunities where there is more nuance as well in terms of mixed sport. So kind of tackling some, some of those underlying barriers of gender inequality definitely could lend itself to... to 
to enable in young women and girls to feel empowered and supported in mixed spaces if they're not getting faced with harassment, if they're not feeling shamed about their body image, if they feel confident within that setting as well. So I think there absolutely are um, examples where it could be it could be mixed, but there's just that sort of background work needing to be done um, in order to support young women and girls feel confident in that space. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Um, moving on to talking about um, role models further, um, David Torrance. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, positive role models, models of support for, for young women. Is there or could social media be used better by these governor organisations and to promote um, the positive aspects? And I'm thinking about TikTok, where a lot of young people will get from, or you just need to see an influencer with a certain juice product and what they managed to do with that. But I was interested last night on the BBC had um, the agency, which was a top influencing women in Scotland, who have huge following, but none of it was to do with sport, it was all to do with clothes, it was all to do with image. Um, is there a place for media that could really impact on young people? Yeah, I think we actually engaged with a couple of influencers who were looking at positive body image and a positive idea around sport and exercise that was sustainable, that was inclusive. Um, and it was really interesting to get their understanding. We also spoke with uh, Dr Helen Sharp, who's a professor at um, Edinburgh University, and she spoke to us about the idea that a lot of influencers, there was a move away from a sort of thin inspiration idea, which was all about weight, to a number of influencers who were focused on an idea of fitness and providing fit inspiration to um, a number of young people. And what we found was that a lot of young girls were interacting with that, but it wasn't necessarily having a positive impact on them because a lot of the, the fit inspiration and body ideals that were being created were creating an unattainable sort of body image and um, idea as to what a sort of female body should look like, especially a, an active one. Um, so while I think there is a really important role for women to have role models that are accessible to them, especially in social media, I think it's important that they're not being sold ideas that are completely unattainable. So really controlled ideas around eating or really controlled ideas around exercise and that exercise is created as something that's positive, not a punishment or to change your body, that it's the messaging that's really important. But there's such a, a great role for um, for people who are doing that positively, and there are so many wonderful examples of that. Social media has a very positive aspect to it, but also has very negative as well, as many of us all know. So what to expense, extent do you feel the impact of social media fitness content on young women's body image has changed since the women, Young Women Lead report was published, and in what ways? Um, I, th I think... I I think again, so we, we conducted this, this report um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and I think there's been a kind of massive shift in um, digital accessibility and, and increased social media um, presence over, over the pandemic. So I think that there has been, um, like Katie was mentioning, like some of the, the body positivity movements have definitely increased over, over that space and there's been lots of more... Um, for example, an area we didn't look at this inquiry was that digital fitness or access to kind of online classes or, or things around that. But there is massive amounts of social media accounts now that focus on online supports and online kind of yeah physical education, sports, dancing, all that sort of stuff. Um, that's that kind of really reduces the bar barriers in a positive way for young women who potentially have disabilities and can't access in person staff or who um, are feeling yeah, low in confidence and can't access in-person classes. However, I think there also is like an increase in um, the negative side of things as well, in terms of we're seeing a lot of, um, I've mentioned already, we're seeing a lot of increased misogynistic stuff on um, social media. So there is a lot of backlash to young women and girls who maybe are participating in sport or a lot of um, role models potentially for young women and girls being targeted by that kind of um, online misogyny and, and kind of toxic behaviours. Um, so I think there's there's been both positive and um, negative changes since the report. Um, I don't know if you've had anything else to add. Yeah, I think um, perhaps there's there's been an expansion in the number of social media sites out there. TikTok wasn't, if it was around, it wasn't, it didn't seem like it was anywhere when we were doing this report. So our report largely did not interact with that. And I think 
it's about a kind of I guess a lack of understanding we're all reacting to the to how big that has become and how much of an impact that has on young people's lives and I think largely that comes from a lack of understanding and regulation around what what's happening in these spaces and for TikTok in particular it's all about that the the user so it's catered to you the the feed is is so incredibly clever at understanding what you what you like and if you're looking at damaging content then that's that's what you're going to continue to to see and we found that a lot around um food patterns and eating that disordered eating if if that's sort of a, a space that you are that you're consuming content on that's what you're going to continue to see and that's where it can become really negative <coughs> if you have a feed that's around positivity and body positivity and that's what you're seeing all the time then that has a really positive impact on you Thank you, Dave. <coughs> Paul. Thank you. I'm very grateful and good morning to uh, the panellists. Um, I, I suppose we've, we've had quite an important discussion there about role models for um, young women in particular, but I think so much of this is, is on men and the behaviour of men and, and we as men changing our behaviours and our attitudes and tackling that, uh, that systemic misogyny. So I, I wonder to what extent, you know, positive role models for men are, 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 are crucial in a lot of this. Um, I, I think Andy Murray is the one that sticks out as uh, always seeking to challenge mm -hmm. some of the kind of inbuilt bias that we see. Mm -hmm. um, but, but did you find, you know, was it something women responded to that actually it's, it's also on men? And, and do we have other examples of where, you know, there are good role models within uh, male sport? That we could we could um, you know hold up as best practice and try and, and push people to do more. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's not something that we explored as part of the inquiry. But I think um, it's it's kind of generally understood um, that men men do hold a massive kind of responsibility in changing behaviours. Come forward to tackle gender equality. I think there have been a, a kind of a number of, of recent instances actually where you've. I've personally seen positive role male, like role models in terms of um, men in sport. So, um, like Gareth Southgate, for example, tends to show a, a very different style of leadership for young boys and young men in terms of the England football team, um, and that was a really positive example. I think Marcus Rashford as well, in terms of that football space, showing that campaign and activism sign, showing that care and compassion and empathy for other people is a really positive role model. Again, I think recently we've we've seen examples of um, Gary Lineker and, and Ian Wright and um, um, Alan Shearer as well. So I think there are definitely some amazing, especially in terms of football, which is one of the kind of sports that, that men are definitely drawn to and, and has a, a kind of traditional, maybe more misogynistic rhetoric around it. Um, there are definitely some really positive role models coming out of that space that could be used as good practice for, for young boys and men. Yeah, I think that's also something that can be built into schools quite easily with active schools and Sports Scotland. And I know they have a, a sort of panel of, of young um, male and female activists who work with them um, and active schools is like encouraging those those senses of male role models early on and, and putting that onus on young boys to also be part of creating inclusive spaces is, is incredibly important. I wonder if um, thank you, that was, that's very helpful and I think it's something we want to, to consider as, as part of this but um, I wonder if I can ask about um, some of the really horrendous examples we've seen uh, and horrendous instances of particularly sexual violence, sexual misconduct uh, in sport um, perpetrated by men uh, and where that has had, I suppose, an impact on, on women's participation because they don't feel that clubs very often uh, are safe spaces um, and don't feel that, you know, if... Because being part of a club and being part of a wider club, um, it, you know, is all about identity and belonging and I think people women I've spoken to often don't feel safe within that space and there's a number of campaigns now around this issue mm -hmm. uh, about how to tackle it and I mean what would your views be on you know there are clubs out there across sport that don't have policies for example on how to handle um, when someone has been found guilty of sexual uh, crimes and even reports of sexual misconduct there's not policies in place to handle that so I appreciate it's maybe not reflected in the report, but it's just a broader question, if I may, on it, do you feel that clubs and governing bodies actually need to go further in that space to give women that confidence? Yeah, I, I absolutely. And I think it goes back to um, what I said right at the very beginning about like leadership pathways for for young women and girls as well into those spaces. So a lot of um, governing bodies and, and sports clubs, for example, might still hold 
trustee boards that are heavily kind of white, 60 plus male dominated spaces and then those voices of young women and girls aren't heard within that space to challenge things like policy, how resources allocated, um, good practice. So we need to be bringing again that the, the young women and, and girls and, and women more generally just voices into those spaces and making sure that they are holding positions of, um, you know, like management positions, non-executive positions, executive positions within clubs, within governing bodies to try and build some of those policies and to bring that lived experience of what it feels like to be a woman in sports to the table and um, to start challenging some of that. There's, there's probably more research needs to be done as well in terms of specific sports. But again, it's that, that young woman led, that woman led participatory research on how can we build spaces that are safe, inclusive, welcoming for young women, by young women, um, and, and how can they be bottom up rather than, than top down? Because I think a lot of the decision making spaces are still held by uh, a kind of a quite kind of a one viewpoint sort of approach rather than appreciating the diversity. And I think there's a lot of clubs and governing bodies that will be moving towards that, but there's still a lot of work needs to be done at community levels, for example, and, and kind of privately owned um, sports clubs as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done around that because I think oftentimes there is not malicious intent in the, the, the governing bodies that, you know, very often we want or anyone wants what's best for your sport. But I think unless you have that lived experience, it's very difficult to understand or even appreciate the risk that young women feel when they're accessing these spaces or the potential concerns that they may have and how big... Um, a message it sends when you are not acting on um, ideas of, of sexual misconduct or sexual violence against women and what that says about what how you believe women are entitled to access that sport. And I think unless you're having an interaction with those voices, it's very difficult to, to ever know the impact that that has. And the message I think it sends is that, that we don't care about you as much as, mm -hmm. um, as we should. And I think it's important that those voices are heard. Thank you. Keep it Thank you, Paul. Um, other Paul, Paul Sweeney. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the. Uh, Sorry about that. As a, as a collective noun for Pauls, but there. Uh, so I just really wanted to touch on the addictive aspects of um, <clears throat> unhealthy body image, um, social media role models. Um, also, you mentioned obviously the the educational context where you know a traumatic incident in school could really damage someone's self confidence um, and could create quite destructive behaviours around addictions, mm -hmm. not necessarily around substances, but also actually trying to create some sort of unattainable goal in terms of physical image. Yeah. Um, so just wondered whether you had any view on particularly the reinforcing mechanisms of social media algorithms, whether this can actually lead to real harm um, and whether that's something you've identified. Um, yeah, I think... Um What's interesting is that the time in which the time frame in which or the age range that we are looking at is an age where largely you're trying to understand who you are as a person and you don't necessarily have a fully developed sense of self. And so as you're trying to figure that out, you're also starting to interact more with social media, but also these these ideas around your body at the same time. And I think that's a crucial stage for trying to then develop the mechanisms that you have for, for control or the, the understanding that you have of, of your body and how you interact with the world around you. At the time, I think there wasn't enough, you know, TikTok wasn't around, as I say, and Instagram was less, that we didn't have reels, there wasn't video-related content. Um, we didn't really examine closely the impact of that constant push for notifications <coughs> and the addictive effects, but just from some of the anecdotal evidence we had, we could see that the, the damage that was having and that people were consistently coming back to that for a, for a sense of who they were, defining themselves in the problematic behaviours were being reinforced and encouraged through social mm. media. Thanks. Uh, did you identify, you mentioned earlier there were good examples. I um, just wonder if you can maybe elaborate a bit on that and whether it's something we could help reinforce from a public policy perspective through public health advertising um, that might help push that in the right direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that one of the, the positive examples of, of social media I've seen is, is I think young Scott do an amazing job in terms of young people's um, information and, and access to information. And I know that they're working really closely with Sports Scotland on the young people's sports panel as well in terms of that role model. And they've been using social media as a, a way of, of sharing information and creating you know, um, young person-led content for other young people to have that peer role model and, and 
healthy narrative around around sports. I think that's one example of where it's worked um, really well. Um, I don't know. Do you have any other examples? Um, not off the top of my head. We did interact with a couple of influencers, but I think largely it's about the messaging rather than the individual. So the messaging being inclusive being about a, a sense of body positivity and autonomy rather than a sense of, of control or mm -hmm. um, in any way punishment or the, the exercises to be used for something to change yourself rather than something that's that's more freeing and that can help you with the, the mental and physical aspects of mm -hmm. um, your health. Do you think rather than having simply a laissez-faire approach to social media influencing happening, that the state could have a more active role in promoting positive messaging through influencers to actually try and direct positive di um, directions, particularly in targeted advertising to young people in particular? Yeah, yeah I, th I guess I think there could be more of a role in understanding where the, where the damage is happening and having a more active role in either regulation or in promoting positive aspects. But I think there's <coughs> probably more... The problem is once you're in these, these areas around misogyny or around, you know, problematic... Mm. Um, areas of, of sort of body images that you you're already entrenched in that and there's so many links and ways around the algorithm and ways around um, finding things and I think perhaps it could be better to to be trying to shut down or, or in some way help regulate those spaces okay. as well yeah that's helpful um, do you think there's particular messages around things like reassurance about managing your diet managing your activity in that sense that it's not about some sort of um what I'm trying to say, some sort of um, self-flagellation exercise, you know, to sort of chase some sort of unattainable image. It's actually something it's about you taking controls or something around that kind of messaging that you think could be quite powerful as a, as a, as a sort of public health message that we could push more. I mean, I'm, yeah. I mentioned this before in one of the debates um, we had around um, vaping, I think it was, around uh, the public health advertisements in the <coughs> 1990s, which were actually quite iconic, mm -hmm. um, and whether we could try and revisit some of that kind of idea yeah. around like, highly effective advertising. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that we, we found was that people felt like the messaging was all around sport being a punishment, and there was a lack of understanding as to sport and how sport could play such an active role in, in your life in a positive way, and how that could be that, that messaging wasn't cutting through to, to a lot of young people was what a positive impact this can have not related to your body. Right. Yeah, our, um, our Status of Young Women in Scotland research in 2019 was had a focus on body image as well, and one of the, the key findings from that was around um, Instagram being like kind of one of the strongest influences on body image. And there was a call for that from, from young women and girls across Scotland to have more... Um, monitoring and, and regulation on how social media platforms operate, which I know isn't in the... the kind of, um, Scottish Parliament that it's more of a in terms of lobbying powers but um, I think there definitely was a call from young women and girls around that regulation and monitoring so I think like a counter to that in terms of that more positive narrative about sport and physical exercise being and being for health and being for general well-being and being for connectedness and enjoyment and, and building friendships rather than a kind of unhealthy narrative would be something that would potentially be able to be a workaround for some of that. Okay, thanks, really helpful. Bring in Stephanie, and then I'll come to Gillian. Thanks very much, convener. Um, going back to again speaking speaking to people at the judo last night, um, I spoke to a really amazing woman who's a mum, who's a teacher, and who also plays competitive rugby. And she was talking about Stuart Hogg uh, getting his 100th cap um, for Scotland. And there's quite a bit of mention of there's actually only five people that, that have that. So... The other three guys are kind of mentioned first in any of the news articles that you see on it there, and they've got between 105 and 110 caps. However, she was telling me about Donna Kennedy, who actually has 115 caps, so has more caps for Scotland than, than any of the men actually got there too. And she actually held the world's most capped women player from 2004 to 2016, so that's over 10 years. So a pretty amazing achievement. So... I'm guessing this is a bit of a rhetorical question, but do you agree with me that, that really, you know, we should be highlighting that and it would be amazing to actually hear Stuart Hogg and others in the media talking about the fact that this is such an amazing achievement for someone to have? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it goes back to, to earlier comments about media representation and ensuring that women's voices and achievements are, are celebrated and, and amplified. Um, and I know there, there's a lot of work being kind of done in Scotland around like Scottish Women and Girls Sports Week, which is a really amazing example of how we can use those opportunities to, to highlight those stories, but it needs to become part of everyday mainstream media narrative. Um, and, and yeah, again, going back to the, the, the role that men can play within that space as well of of actually recognising that their, their their female colleagues have also made a great achieve, achievements and, and celebrating that alongside as a kind of a sign of allyship towards their, their women colleagues as well. So I think, yeah, 100% would agree with that, yeah. Thanks, convener. Just coming back to what um, what Paul was saying a wee minute ago about that that almost punishment side of exercise. Obviously, with with influencers and things, we don't want that to become a thing for for young women and teenage girls and and things now. But there is still that older young women cohort mm -hmm. who, for in the early noughties and things, that that was the reality of of physical exercise and physical activity for many of us. And Many of those people shied away from exercise and organised team sport and all those sorts of things for those for those reasons of it being seen as a punishment. And many of those people, many of those women will now feel that they should know what they enjoy doing in terms of physical activity and sport. How do you think we can reverse some of that damage and also give those opportunities without that stigma mm -hmm. to that that age group to come back to physical activity and be able to take new things up that they maybe didn't when they were younger because of that mm -hmm. i think um what's really interesting is that around when we when we actually started the panel there was a little bit of discussion about that that a lot mm -hmm. of us had felt that way mm -hmm. and that while we had a real interest in this part of that came from that exact yeah. feeling that this hadn't always been an area mm -hmm. that we felt comfortable with and there was a level of uncomfortableness exploring this um but I think we found that a real route in was around motherhood. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, that's not something that, that every woman experiences, but we found that a great route to re-engaging was around um, mother and baby classes, but also um, sort of providing spaces that were relaxed, that were perhaps shorter windows of time that women mm -hmm. could engage with. Um, and we found that that was a really good route into at least experiencing some form of movement and sort of, I guess, reminding yourself that this could be enjoyable and nice and this could be something that I do with a community of people who are going through the same life changes as I am. Mm -hmm. So there are great examples of um, mother and baby yoga or um, classes where you're able, gym classes where you're able to bring your children along with you. And that was a really good way of trying to at least build community around more than just sport but also around what was happening mm -hmm. in your life at that time. Um, so that that was just one of the, the great yeah. that we found. I think also in terms of um, like university again is another another example and not mm -hmm. every woman will go to university and that has a certain amount of socioeconomic barriers for women who don't but um, that is as personally my experience was um, going to university was how I got back into to netball um, so I think that tends to be a, a really great way of of fresher spheres and, and sports spheres mm -hmm. and things like that of, of showing the different um, opportunities and having those tasting opportunities and I wonder if there's some learning that could be done from that university model that could yep. be taken to a more place-based community-based yeah aspect in terms of supporting women who don't go to university or, or who explore other other routes mm -hmm. um, in terms of that. We've got time for one more convener. Thank you. Um, obviously, one of those other barriers coming out of university is going into a working environment, having to establish whole new routines or going into different working environments and establishing whole routines. And I think everybody around this table would probably say that our current employment is definitely a barrier to, <laughs> to us getting out and, and getting active. Do you think that looking as a society at things like four day work weeks and flexible working and things like that would, would provide more space? for women with different caring responsibilities, mothers, or those of us who are just plain busy to be able to get out and prioritise our health a bit more as well. Yeah, um, so I suppose as at the Young Women's Movement, we do operate a, a four-day working week. So all of our staff are on four-day working weeks um, for, for full-time equivalent salary yep. as well. So um, it's not pro rata at all. Um, and that offers the flexibility for um, the women within our organisation to, yeah, 
choose again it comes back to that kind of choice of what do they want to do with that that extra day that they have um, i've not done any specific questioning around whether people are using it for sport and exercise yeah. but i yeah. think they're definitely overall will be. well-being um yeah overall well-being <laughs> has came back massively and um, we've been operating um, under that model for over a year now um, and definitely wouldn't return um to kind of a five-day week the um, staff responses to kind of well-being is, is overwhelming it's mm -hmm. been such a positive um, implementation um, and even things like you know ensuring that there is um, kind of flexibility within the working day to take lunches for example when mm -hmm. works for um, individuals to be able to go for those walks our staff um, I know that one of our staff members for example tends to start especially in winter tends to start a bit earlier and finish earlier in the afternoon so that they can still go out and access um, mm -hmm. runs and walks within because of safety um, and light hours as well. So just offering those flexible approaches to working mm -hmm. is, is really important and, and encouraging the overall well-being of, of women and, and men in, in employment situations, but um, specifically around being able to access sport um, and exercise. I agree. I think it's just really key that we tackle those big structural things as well as those individual behavioural things, and that comes down to the planning side, but also comes down to that employment side too, I think. Thanks, Convener. Thank, thank you, Gillian. Um, we now have got a, a final theme on inclusivity, which we touched on throughout the whole morning, but we've got specific questions from Paul Kane. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. And I suppose with, with all of this theme, it's the intersectionality, I suppose, of, 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 of issues that, that impact um, you know, women and girls in sport. Um, and of course, there are there are various areas which were covered in in your report. But I suppose I'm particularly interested in um, LGBTQ plus uh, young women uh, in particular, uh, and around their access. I mean, how you know how do we support those women to feel secure, supported, safe in sport? Uh, and you've touched on this already, but I just wondered if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, um, so I think in, in relation to the, the LGBTQ um, plus community, there's a there's a general need to reduce stigmatisation, um, and, that, and that kind of goes without saying. Um, we we found in our, our survey there was some feedback around changing rooms, for example, um, and and that we need to be reducing the stigma for for lesbian and bisexual women um, specifically around them being able to access changing facilities without that. Um, pressure from their peers or potential stigma from their peers. Um, I think that in terms of um, trans inclusion in sport, that's really, really important. Um, as the Young Women's Movement, we are, are, are an intersectional organisation. We wholeheartedly um, support the, the trans women, the, the trans community generally, but trans women specifically, to be able to access those same opportunities um, that women will you know, be able to access in terms of sport and, and physical exercise. And I think it's really important to highlight the additional barriers that they will face um, in terms of accessing um, sport and physical exercise. You know, we, it, it's already difficult for, for cis women to access sport and physical exercise. So those barriers that trans women will face will be even more augmented and, and compounded because of the, the inequalities and the prejudice that they face across society. So there needs to be a real intersectional approach taken to um, ensuring that their lived experience and that their voices are included within um, any sort of recommendations going forward and that um, there are a number of organisations out there such as LGBT Youth Scotland and um, trans organisations that are are the experts in supporting um, trans women and trans men in the LGBTQ plus community and, and those organisations should, should be part of that conversation to make sure that those lived experiences are really heard and meaningfully embedded. Yeah, I think just to bring it back to the report as well, we had 25.8% um, that identified themselves as being LGBTQ plus and 22% of those people had a negative um, experience with sport. And so I think that the, the impact of, of ability to access sport is even higher for those who would identify as LGBTQ+. And so therefore, it's crucial to, to understand the lived experience of, of people and, and understand how the services can be improved to make them feel um, like that they've got more access. And I suppose picking up from a previous theme about... Um you know, the discriminatory language we hear, um, clubs and governing bodies not always tackling uh, homophobia uh, appropriately. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of um, focus on that recently. Um, 
More so, obviously, in the male space, um, to, to do with um, male players in football in particular. Mm -hmm. But do you think there is still an underlying... I mean, I, mean, I think it is clear that, that there's issues around homophobic language in women's football in particular, mm -hmm. uh, and stereotyping, I think, very often of women who play football. Um, did, did that come through in any, in any meaningful way, but that, that kind of uh, abuse and language being a real barrier and maybe clubs and governing bodies not dealing with it appropriately? It wasn't something that necessarily came through um, in the report because it wasn't necessarily the focus. We weren't really we were looking more at the school experience or, or sort of earlier than that. What did come through though was um, an idea around f female bodies who play sport and how they were abused for their bodies not looking typically feminine to, mm. to an ideal as to you know a, a cultural ideal as to what that is, and I think that that's only going to be further replicated in a professional setting, um, I can only imagine that, that that's even worse there. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I think with all of these issues, there's so much uh, to, to get into. Um, but the other, the other question I had, and I was particularly interested in, would be the socioeconomic factors um, that affect uh, many uh, women and girls in sport and those barriers, I suppose. Uh, and do you see that in terms of having to access, um, you know, materials, having to access kit, having to, you know, sports being played in a very particular way that very often is, um, you know, geared towards men, to be quite honest, and and, and very kind of male-centric. And, uh, you know, and, and I think we see that in so many aspects of life, that everything is dealt with through a kind of patriarchal structure. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is that something that then adds a barrier in terms of cost and in terms of being able to, to access different sports? I, th I think it does. I think especially if you're someone who's disengaged from sport, it's very difficult to then justify if you're struggling that you need to invest in um, joining a club or invest in, in materials or resources to be able to play sport when you have thus far not had a successful time with it or aren't already engaged in it. And I think we all, it also comes back to what we were talking about, about the feminist town planning and the, the sort of safe spaces is that a lot of these community spaces um, are, are a means to access for free, but if they're not safe, then we're, we're throwing up further barriers, not just in terms of women's safety, but also for people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, and we're basically stopping them from being able to access um, sport or the ability to play sport in somewhere that's safe. I think there's a, a number of good examples, again, um, across Scotland. So I'm thinking of North Lanark, or um, local authority in particular. I know that they've got a, an active teens, like free membership for, for young people. I think it's 11 to 16. Um, and so there's, and we've, we've recently seen the success of the free transport for under 22s that, that's on the Young Scot card. So I think there's some good infrastructure already in place that could be kind of harnessed going forward to ensure that like young women, especially under the ages of, of 26, in terms of having that access to Young Scott card, um, could use in terms of like free access to leisure facilities or free access to, to gyms. Um, and also just in terms of that, that awareness raising around, yeah, like Katie was saying, around using parks and, and green spaces. And, and there's a lot of community organisations that are offering free sporting opportunities or free you know, fitness opportunities, but it's, it's a lack of awareness and a lack of understanding. So there's a kind of, yeah, a real need to kind of increase that campaign and, and you know, public health messaging around, you know, where can women access this in terms of like new mums? Is there stuff that could be put in the Baby Box Initiative, for example, that says this is how you can get back into sport and fitness? Um, so, yeah. And, and you touched on in a previous answer that, um, potential for you know gym classes and sports activities to become accessible with a childcare element attached to that i mean do you feel that's something that's important as well to to create i suppose more flexible options for people um being able to um you know work sport into their life rather than the other way around yeah absolutely i think we've seen um, recently like the, the, the cost of childcare for for young for young for young mums for any mum for any parent actually um have, have significantly increased and we've i think it was the poverty alliance did some research around the impact on um young well, women in generally around the cost of living crisis and how they are taking on a lot of the kind of the brunt of childcare um and that will certainly impact their ability and their capacity to then be able to go and take part in in sports so having accessible childcare options within leisure facilities within kind of sporting clubs or being able to take part in like 
baby and mum or baby and parent um, like you know classes is, is really important to kind of reduce that barrier. Thanks, Kavina. Um, I want to ask about disabled women because um, you know we, we've been yesterday from some of the sports bodies um, we had uh, representatives from Disability Scotland and talking about some of the barriers that women who are disabled faced in access and physical activity and sport not just you know at the dropout points but throughout throughout their, their, their young and their adolescent and then into the young womanhood as well. Was that anything that you you got any evidence on? Um, we did. We, 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 we spoke about protected characteristics um, and, and disability was part of that. I don't, again, I think it was, it was one of the areas where we didn't get a significantly high enough response to make any um, kind of huge claims about that on it. Um, there... I think it goes back to yeah what we're saying about like similarly to the other protected characteristics it's about young women with who are facing disabilities being part of that process and having their kind of voices embedded within mm -hmm. that to to co-design and to um, share their feedback in terms of research about what what works for them and what doesn't work for them um, and and maybe more capacity building and training for for coaches for teachers for youth workers around how to meaningfully support young women and women with disabilities within a, a sports setting and how to make that an inclusive and welcoming and safe spaces with their voices at the centre of that. Um, and I think that's just, it's kind of, it should be kind of standardised across all the protected characteristics is just ensuring that that lived experience is heard and meaningfully kind of involved in the, the process. Designing things with people yes. rather than right. hearing their issues after things have been yeah, uh, structured. Yeah. Um, Sandesh, you have a question on this? Um, um, two, two brief questions. Um, the first is about um, periods. So um, Beth England, uh, woman's footballer in England, um, made uh, was talking about it and talking about how it affected her when it came to training, how she felt washed out. Um, and obviously if we talk about girls and, and young people, they've not grown into their body, they don't really know about it. So what has your report said about how periods affect girls, their participation in sport, but also what we can do to maybe help? Yeah, I think at the time um, we spoke a lot about period products being crucial for access to sport and, and feeling comfortable um, to, to play sport and feeling supported. Um, one thing we also spoke about was the lack of diagnosis for things like endometriosis when especially young girls are in a lot of pain as a result of um, health conditions and don't necessarily know their bodies well enough to know when something is, is not necessarily normal. And the amount of pain that they are feeling or the impact that that's having on, on their ability to exercise or engage in sport is really troubling and they don't necessarily have the language to communicate that in a school setting or to teachers and perhaps even not as enough awareness around those menstrual issues with um, teaching staff as well who are having to to provide um, you know sort of plans or programs for um, exercise and also you know I think that's something that's been there's been more aware awareness of now is how your cycle affects your ability to interact with different levels of exercise and how you should probably be catering your training and your sort of level of exercise based on your cycle once you've got an awareness of that but I think as a young girl that's something that you don't necessarily have enough knowledge or resource around and one of the recommendations that we made was having a space for young women to go and have really clear public health information around the changes to their body around the impact that their periods could have and I think probably linked to how that may be affecting their mood and their energy levels and their fatigue and I think having somewhere that I think in, in a school setting when you're having that sort of education and you're in a class full of people it can be really uncomfortable to ask difficult questions or to feel like you're not experiencing something different to to your peers and having somewhere to go that has really clear but easy to understand information is, is crucial to removing some of that stigma even okay. just in, in young girls themselves. Thank you and and my second question uh, is about pregnancy and you know, uh, earlier you had said that you'd spoken to young mothers but you know, if we look at elite sport and again I go back to the England women's team with Tony Duggan um, the Everton player who got maternity leave and then finally there's some maternity leave being given. But in general, women who have children don't tend to be in elite sport. And 
I wonder if that, I know this is part of the role models, but that sort of gives a bit of a negative image. And so what, how can we make it more normal and how can we encourage uh, women who have children or are pregnant to participate? I think it goes back to, to a reason awareness campaigns and, and public health messages again and um, ensuring that there's um, good practice examples out there of how women can still participate whilst they're pregnant and, and, and kind of to challenge some of the maybe like more damaging messages around like you know if oh you're pregnant you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing sport which tends to be you know like the kind of normal narrative but actually there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if you're already active you can continue to be participated in sport and it's about that that healthy advice so maybe supporting yeah um, midwives, healthcare professionals, people that w women that are about to have a child come into contact with around those kind of safe public health messages and, and awareness raising campaigns of, of role models who are already doing that with, yeah, maybe not in elite sports, but actually within community based sports as well. Um, and just like, yeah, building awareness and, and showcasing good practice examples of how that's already happening. I think as well that comes back to the governing bodies and the lack of women on sports government bodies is that if you don't have those voices discussing the idea of, of maternity rights and taking time out for maternity at an elite level then you're never you're not going to encourage that um, those rights to come into place and I think the more that we can encourage women into places of decision making in sport then the more those questions can start to be answered. Thank you. I have a question from Stephanie. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, just you touched on endometriosis there and you touched on heavy periods and it's something that myself, I suffered from really badly when I was younger. And you're absolutely right about the fact that we're not educating young women and girls about what's normal uh, and what they should be expecting and when they should seek support. Um, so I completely agree with that. Sometimes, you know, it was a challenge getting through a full period in school, mm -hmm. uh, never mind actually going and jumping about and doing PE. But I suppose um, my concern with that as well is how, how, how do we ensure um, that teachers uh, and support staff are actually listening to girls and they're taking them seriously because this is something that we hear repeatedly right through right across different different portfolios and remits is that women and girls are often not listened to so I'm wondering if there's if there's anything that you can say about that thank you yeah, I think I think in terms of um, women's healthcare generally, it's ten it tends to be a subject that isn't as widely researched, um, and especially when it comes to to kind of endometriosis um, periods, like premenstrual dysphoric um, disorder, for example, is something that a, a lot of like young women wouldn't have awareness of or know about. Um, and then if the if the young women themselves don't have awareness about it, then the teachers, the educators, the youth workers, the yeah. The, the kind of professionals within that space might not have an awareness of it as well. So I think there needs to be um, some capacity building and um, training and resources that could be co-designed by young women themselves around how they're feeling, like, you know, a, a specific piece of work around young women who um, have been diagnosed with endometriosis, for example, and, and co-designing training and toolkits and resources and information for teachers that could be rolled out across Scotland to sort of raise awareness of the real if issues I could of just that pause you there as well. Mm. I think really probably the biggest concern I've got, obviously it takes you a very long time, quite often to get diagnosed with endometriosis yes. um, or whether it's really heavy periods, which I know there is a correct name for, but I don't know off patches now there. But I think I think the, one of the big issues is actually around actually women and girls being trusted, so they don't necessarily have a diagnosis, but if they're going and they're speaking to a teacher, yes. which can involve a huge amount of courage to actually have that conversation, and then they're kind of like fobbed off with, oh, do you know what, stop trying to get out with it, go on with it. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that's more the issue that I'm looking to get to. Yeah, I think, um, like, coming from an educational background, I think that there is more of a push towards understanding young people's voices and understanding and, and sort of taking into account how they co-design things. But I think it is largely around an education piece as to the barriers that, that women are facing. I don't think anyone or, or many people going into education are, are are not doing it for the right reason and are not looking for the best interests of the children. Absolutely. And I think that it's all about an education piece. A lot I imagine a lot of people who go into uh, to teaching physical education have not had barriers to sport and have, have, have found that an easy route to success. And I think it could be important 
to have adequate training for staff linked to inset days, linked to local training, eh, local authority training that really educates on and how that's going to impact because it, it isn't just on the physical education of a child, it's, it's across the board as you say, it's difficult to focus when you're in an excruciating amount of pain and to, to go to six or seven lessons throughout a day and feel like you're having to re-explain yourself can be very difficult and there's certainly ways where that could be communicated in a really kind and constructive way but we I guess that's something that we have to speak to, to schools and educators about to understand better. Thanks. It's, it's good to know that co-design is, is, you know, talking about trust and agency and, and girls being understood. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've, we've kept you longer than we said we would, but that's <laughs> because everything you're saying has been so valuable. And uh, certainly what's been particularly valuable, I think, for m myself and the clerks, is some of the, the other groups that you've mentioned that, that, that you're aware of that uh, we can pick up on as well. So thank you for your time today. At our next meeting, uh, we will undertake routine scrutiny of NHS boards and then continue taking formal evidence as part of our inquiry into female participation in sport and physical activity. But that does end our uh, formal and public part of our meeting today. Thank you. <laughs>